At seven o'clock, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to five minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes. I think minutes. we have something else in front of that. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> is this working? Yes. All right, I'm going to call down Mr. Nathan Barbera. Many of you will know him. He spent the last nine years sitting at the dais in the last year or two, I think, sitting in the chair seat. I don't think anyone's ever served on PMZ that long, and he's oversung so many different things, but uh, did a phenomenal job uh, for the city, mentored many, many commissioners that came through, was always available to answer a question or to give guidance if needed, and honestly, Nathan, you, you helped make the road a little smoother for all of us, so thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate y'all having me here tonight and showing, passing this on since I didn't get the, the chance to be here at the last meeting. Uh, but I'm excited for the new commissioners and uh, to be carrying on what we do. It's very important. And please remember one thing. I'll get on my soapbox. Don't ever look at things based on what this group or what that group says or what the politics of this are and what the politics of that are. Make your decisions based on what you believe is in the best interest of the city for, of Plano and not what everybody's telling you on one side or another side, but what you believe is in the best interest of the city of Plano, and you'll do a fine job, and the city will com continue to be a city of excellence. Thank you. Now I'll read items of public, yeah. <laughs> public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to five minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The Planning and Zoning Commission may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The Planning and Zoning Commission <clears throat> excuse me, may choose to place the item on a future agenda. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Do we have any speakers? We do not. Thank you. Consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. The items may be removed from this agenda for individual consideration by commissioners, staff, or any citizen. Citizens are limited to two items and discussion time of three minutes each. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Thank you. Does anyone want to move an item from the consent agenda? Seeing none, can I get a... Make a motion we approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Commissioner Horn with a second by Commissioner Carey to approve the consent agenda. Please vote as soon as we get the tally board up. Commissioner Ali, there you go. Thank you. And that item carries seven to zero. Uh, FYI, we're missing Commissioner Bronski tonight. I think he had a family illness. <clears throat> 
Um, before we get to items for individual consideration, I know there's a lot of uh, individuals here that want to speak tonight. And if, if you read through the public hearing items, you'll notice there's some uh, text in italics, and it's something we've added recently. There's some confusion, I think, in the public space, um, and, and even something we needed to discuss here amongst us, that a public hearing doesn't mean that it's a zoning case. A zoning case does allow the commission some latitude around making decisions, placing requirements, things of that nature. But a public hearing can also be something that's administrative, a replat, a site plan, a revision to a site plan. And in an administrative role, the role for these, this commission is to approve that under state law. We need to approve it unless we can very carefully, clearly show that staff's interpretation of the code is incorrect. Staff spends a lot of time making sure they're not incorrect because uh, that would obviously not be good for any of us. So as we move through these items and you look at item one underneath, it doesn't say legislative. That means it's an administrative item. So our latitude here is very, very slim, if any. Uh, item 2A, underneath it says legislative consideration. That's a zoning case. We have a lot more latitude in what we can do, uh, what we can request, um, what we can require. So I just want everyone to be aware of that because I know there's a lot of um, speakers and a lot of interest in item one. But so you'll understand, this is not a zoning case where we have a lot of latitude. Under state law, we're pretty much required to approve this the way it sits. The landowner has the right under its current zoning to build it the way they've designed it. So uh, just make sure everyone understands that. So when we start having our dialogue, understand that we may um, hear and even agree with some of your concerns, but our ability to do anything about that is very limited. So let's go on to items for public consideration, please. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes of presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Agenda item number one is a public hearing, preliminary replat, and revised site plan. St. Andrew's Edition, Block 1, Lot 2R, Religious Facility on one lot on 21.2 acres, located at the southwest corner of Plano Parkway and Mira Vista Boulevard. Zone Plan Development 52, Single Family Residence 7. Applicant is St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. with the planning department. The purpose for the revised site plan and preliminary replot is to propose a religious facility building on an existing lot. Staff has reviewed it based upon the PD 52 SF7 zoning. The PD was approved in 1998 and has some restrictions and allowances. The PD allows a maximum building height of three stories, 48 feet throughout the property. A 30-foot landscape setback is required along the western property line as shown on the revised site plan. <clears throat> a landscape plan has been submitted and is under review to ensure that the required landscaping is provided, including trees along the western property line. Currently, a portion of the western property line has the required masonry and wrought iron screening wall. It will be extended as noted on the plan. And lastly, we did receive 33 unique email responses in opposition, and we received 12 duplicate for a total of 45 responses. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions, and the applicant also has a presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions for staff? Commissioner Horn. Yes, thank you, Donna, for the presentation. Uh, this replat and, and the site plan, et cetera, was pro provided under interim comprehensive plan. Is that correct? It's not being reviewed under the interim yeah. concert comprehensive plan, just the zoning ordinance okay. and subdivision ordinance. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is the setbacks that we have on this. We, you stated that it's three stories, 48 feet. So the site plan shows that we're there at the proper set, setback. Is that correct? Yes. The top of the chapel, the cross.
across is actually 48 and a half feet, but there is a allowance in the zoning ordinance that religious facilities can exceed the maximum height as long as they increase their side yard setback. And as you can kind of see on here, they did increase it to 12 feet. So the required side, side yard setbacks is originally 10 feet, but they have increased it to 12 feet to be in compliance. All right, thank you. Other questions for staff? Okay, so is the applicant here as well? Uh, yes, we have David Bond. Mr. Chairman, members of commission, David Bond with Spires Engineering, 765 Custer Road here in Plano. Here tonight on behalf of St. Andrews uh, United Methodist to respectfully request your approval of this item. Uh, as Donna mentioned, we are in compliance with the zoning and subdivision ordinances of the city. Uh, we have a few uh, slides here to share with you some of the vision for the project. For that, I'm going to call Mr. Forrest Poole uh, with the church. Thank you. My name's, <clears throat> my name's Forrest Poole. I'm the COO at St. Andrew United Methodist Church. And we wanted to, you know, we understand this is an administrative process, but we want to give you a little background on, on this project. Um, Robert Hasley started St. Andrew United Methodist Church in Shepton High School uh, 36 years ago. Had a couple hundred people and sent up here um, from Holland Park, and he started uh, St. Andrew. Over the last 36 years, he's grown that church into a thriving, growing church. Uh, we've got right now about 7,000 members, and there's several of our lay leaders here today um, in support of this project. Um, and we were able to cel celebrate a huge milestone for our church in March of this year when uh, Robert Hasley. Uh, passed on, we transitioned his leader, his senior, leadership as senior pastor to our new senior pastor, Arthur Jones, and Robert uh, is intending on staying on as the founding pastor and being part of our staff. Unfortunately, in April of this year, so we got to celebrate that for about a month, and in April of this year, we learned, uh, we were all devastated to learn of Robert's um, cancer diagnosis with an aggressive form of cancer. Uh, we thought we had a lot of time to celebrate Robert and to honor him. Um, and, but whenever this diagnosis came out, our lay leadership uh, and our church leadership knew that we had to speed up those plans. Um, we had discussed, uh, for, the, for the last several years, we've been discussing the need for a 250-seat chapel on our property. And the lay leaders thought this would be the perfect way to honor Robert. Robert was very excited to hear about the idea of a chapel nestled alongside, as you'll see in these pictures. Um, I guess I can do those. A chapel nestled alongside the, uh, our beautiful columbarium overlooking our pond, uh, something that's reminiscent of his uh, home in Arkansas, the chapels you would see there. Um, but he absolutely did not like the idea of his name being on it. Uh, a lot of these people behind me uh, let him know that that wasn't his choice. Um, and so uh, in October, there was a lot of work behind the scenes, obviously, for something like this. Um, but in October, we were able to announce to our church community the idea of a Hasley Chapel honoring Robert. We're here today as part of that process to make it a reality. For this PNZ board meeting, um, we want, you know, as was already stated by staff, uh, to let you know that the zoning for our property, which determines the size, scale, setbacks, the use, all those things, has been in place for 23 years since 1998. We're not seeking any variances or exceptions to that zoning to build the Hazley Chapel. As with any project, um, as you guys uh, certainly know, in the city of Plano, there are neighbors impacted from construction and building. Uh, knowing this, our architects and design teams have been very intentional to make sure we're building a structure within all the current zoning requirements and city ordinances. In October, just after we announced our, to our congregation the idea of a Hazley Chapel, we were contacted by one of our neighbors and that was, and we had the first of a series of meetings regarding our plans. And the three meetings we had with the, with the immediate neighbors and representatives from the HOA, uh, we've listened to their concerns and ideas. Uh, we've informed them that we will continue working with them, seeking their input on landscaping, screening, and other items uh, to minimize the impact of the new chapel on them. In addition, we paid our uh, civil engineers and architects to look at an alternative location that the neighbors proposed uh, which for a multitude of reasons was determined to be inferior to the current plan. In, oh, sorry. In summary, our property 
has been zoned and planned for this use for years. The proposed plan complies with the zoning and city requirements. And once we receive PNZ's approval today, we will, con we will move forward in our design process and we'll, we will continue to communicate with our neighbors regarding screening and other things as neighbors do. We would ask that PNZ vote today to approve our plan without any further delay of our project. And our prayer is to celebrate a real groundbreaking with Robert Hasley present this coming April. Thank you. <clears throat> and lastly, for a few remarks, our architect, Mike Lear, with Good Fulton and Farrell. GFF. Good evening. My name is Mike Lear with GFF Architects. We're the architects for this project. I just thought it may be helpful. Uh, this is the facade plan that was submitted as part of the planning submission. Uh, just zoom in a little bit here on the south building elevation to clarify, I, I think, what was maybe some misconception about the overall building height. Uh, so this south ele elevation is taken looking at the, the front entry of the chapel. Uh, so the uh, adjacent properties uh, to the west are on the left side of this sheet. Uh, the building itself is set back from the property line approximately 36 feet. Uh, and that first wall that you see there, the low wall, is 18 feet high. Uh, that extends uh, across, you can see to the right, where the extent of the stone is, where you can see the start of the glass, uh, where the roof of the main chapel then um, proceeds up to a pitched roof that starts at a, a little over 23 feet and then uh, increases to the ridge at, at a little over 30, uh, 135 feet. Uh, that distance is approximately 87 and a half feet uh, from the adjacent property line on the west. And the cross tower, uh, which is shown as the 46 foot height, uh, we can clarify, I think the, the uh, height that was listed uh, in staff's presentation took into account the adjacent grading around uh, the perimeter of the building. But that being the tallest point of the building uh, on the far east side, uh, which is mounted to uh, the tower, which you can also see the, the height listed there at uh, 37 and a half feet. Uh, the scale and proportion of this building is appropriate to its use. Uh, that's what we were tasked to design. And honestly, uh, as it relates to the adjacent property, is a similar scare, scale to a residential structure, uh, again, which is what's immediately adjacent to the west. So with that, that's all my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone here have a question for the applicant before we open the public hearing? OK. We have a question for the applicant. Yeah, I'm curious. You mentioned a multitude of reasons, and you know, it, it looks like you you do have the right to build what you're building there. Uh, in terms of why you didn't move to a site suggested by the neighbors, and I guess I'm just curious what some of those reasons were. Um, from my side, on the civil engineering side, sir, um, you know, you look at things like um, if there are utilities in the way. Um, what sort of infrastructure would have to be torn out and replaced? Uh, where the site's at now, it's up. It's kind of tucked away in the parking. So from a uh, an infrastructure side of things, it's it's simplest where it's at there because you're kind of expanding more so than redeveloping um, a current area. Um, I think the as far as the vision of the project, I think either uh, maybe Forrest. If, I can't comment as much uh, about the vision. I'll let Forrest do that um, about the. Sure, as far as the vision of the project, um, I, I don't know if y'all have had a chance to come to our property. We've got a beautiful pond. Um, we've got an uh, incredible columbarium right next to it. Um, the main intent of the chapel was to be nestled in where you're overlooking the pond and you're nestled next to the columbarium. Um, if, I don't know if y'all have seen any pictures from like chapels in Arkansas with the glass in the, in the woods, but um, we've got an incredible place we've developed and maintained as you know in nature and the idea is this is settled into that those woods so when you're inside the chapel you really do feel like you're in the hills of Arkansas in West Plano and so when we looked the the uh, neighbors proposed a, a location um, on the east side of our property which had had we 
gone to that location, we'd have a different set of neighbors in here talking uh, uh, today. But um, the neighbor's proposal location on the east side of our property, and um, we looked at that, and the vision just didn't match what we were what we were looking to do. It was exposed to the park. It was exposed to Mira Vista, and it it wasn't nestled in. You had uh, a view uh, west from the from the you know, where the chancel would be, but you're missing a lot of the other aspects of the project. And the last thing is the, the main feeder road that we're gonna be utilizing for this is Plano Parkway. And uh, Mira Vista is not, you know, we don't think it makes sense to put the traffic of what we're looking at doing on uh, Mira Vista. Thank you very much. Um, we got multiples going on here. I'll, ladies first, then I guess, Commissioner Tom. Thank you, President. Um, I have a quick question to the architect. I. Um, look at this drawing that we have on the screen right now is the south elevation and just uh, from a neighbor's point of view I know the west side of neighbors had the most concerns can you show us the elevation or the the view from the west of the property what it looks like from the side the west elevation is the one on the top uh, that, that you're seeing there so the low wall that I mentioned before at the 18 foot height is uh, runs horizontally along the lower section. And then the upper portion is the chapel roof uh, that pops up above that. And there are actual windows on the side. Would yes. there be stairs or floors underneath the window or they're just like in the air? No, so there's, there's a series of rooms that are organized along uh, that west side of the building to basically serve as accessory to the chapel itself. So there's a parlor, uh, there's a, a green room uh, type space, uh, which the windows are really just providing some natural light uh, in those areas. It's only one story, um, so mm -hmm. no stairs involved. Were you asking about the, the ones up, up, up tall in the Claire story? Right. What she's asking getting to, I guess, is are people going to be looking through those windows down right. into right. the neighbor's yard? So the, uh, the balcony space is probably to the furthest, uh, to the right of that image that you can see. Um, the main chapel, uh, those windows, you can probably see from just estimating from the elevations there are above the 18 foot wall that you see to the west. Mm -hmm. um, so they're significantly high in the air. So from the main chapel space itself, uh, there's not the opportunity for visibility. Mm -hmm. uh, the balcony in the rear, there's some limited seating that's provided there along with an organ, um, mainly for choir that are directed to the chancel platform, which is viewing to the north. Um, they are at a higher elevation, and I honestly can't speak to the exact sight lines of what would be visible from that point, but obviously it's elevated at, at that mm -hmm. point. It's about 15 feet above the main floor elevation, the balcony. And what's the distance between that little um, roll of windows and the west side of that building on the first floor? Like, what's the distance between the window and the side? The distance the between the windows and the property line? Was that the question? Yes. Along the west. Uh, so the building itself is set off the property line approximately 36 feet. So that would be the distance to the windows. To these. From the oh, to the clear story windows. I'm sorry. So it's an additional uh, 27 feet additional uh, in addition to the 36, so 63 feet mm -hmm. from the property line. Okay. Thank you. Of course. And a question for the church, if y'all would mind coming back to the podium. Can you just elaborate a little bit on, are y'all planning regular services? Is this for special events or just curious? It doesn't vary on your case. I'm just curious. Sure. So the, the main purpose of this uh, chapel will be uh, worship and funerals and weddings. Uh, at St. Andrew, we have a 1,600-seat main sanctuary. Uh, we have a 50-seat chapel. Most weddings and funerals fall in between there, and we haven't been able to serve those uh, well, which is really the main driver for needing a chapel, um, about 250 seats. And so, yeah, this, the, main, the main use of this chapel will be uh, weddings and funeral services and worship. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, meeting with the neighbors mm -hmm. uh, three times, I believe. Can you um, just give an example of what feedback you incorporated into your design going forward, <clears throat> the neighbors' feedback? What, so example of a feedback we incorporated into our design? Correct. So most of the, most of the feedback that we're going to be incorporating from the neighbors into our design is going to be related to screening that, that top picture. Um, the vegetation, everything along that that wall, making sure it blends in as well as it can to the to the um, surrounding woods. Um, one of the things we discussed at length with our neighbors was um, the fact that we both have uh, similar uh, goals of not being able to see each other. You know, the idea of being nestled in our hills of Arkansas doesn't mean you see a two-story house next door to you. So we're going to be doing um, as much work as possible uh, to create that that feel for our property as well, which will obviously benefit the neighbors. Um, but yeah, that's the main thing is, is related to screening. And we had conversations with them about um, uh, noise related like tra uh, dumpsters and things like that. And we told them we, we didn't intend to put any trash uh, pick up at this site that's going to stay where it is on the east side of our property. Um, there were a few other things like that we discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, we've received quite a few responses here about um, um, the, the neighbors not wanting a conference center. So to be clear, this is going to be a chapel, not a conference center, and you're going to be using it for morning services, weddings, funerals, <clears throat> occasional evening service. But is that correct? The design intent, and this is the design intent we gave to our architects for this space was 80% chapel, 20% functional for other meetings. So this is designed as a chapel. Okay, thanks. Yes, uh, are you intending or have you added any additional parking for this building or are you within code overall? Are we in good shape there? I assume we are. Yeah, we're, we're significantly overparked per code. Um, I know the church functionally needs more than the code um, allows. Um, at one point, they considered uh, a parking structure on the northeast corner of the property that it wasn't pr uh, proceeded with because of the impact and feedback from the neighbors on the other side of Mira Vista. Um, they do have a cross parking agreement with some of the offices south of Plano Parkway. Mm -hmm. So on Sunday mornings, if you're coming, there's shuttles and off duty officers and things like that. Um, so we're well over parked per code. Um, we could use every parking space we can get functionally. Thank you. Okay, are we good? All right, uh, thank you. Sir, oh. one more question regarding the function of the um, this new chapel here. It's probably not going to impact on the um, decision, but we wonder if there's any noise that they may create, like bells or music they may play, you know? You're talking about noise from like a, a service inside or something like that? Uh, Is that not your... inside, but outside, like something that will sound around. There, there's not a bell tower or anything like that, if that's what you're asking. The and intent the is the sound associated with the chapel will stay inside the chapel. Okay. So there's no courtyard or speakers outside? For... Yeah, definitely no outdoor speakers. I mean, a, there's a, a, a patio space for, you know, gathering like you would before or after a wedding, but no... Mm -hmm artificial, you know, outdoor speakers or anything like that proposed uh, with what you're seeing here tonight. Thank you. Know, you. Then as far as the noise ordinance, you know, we're not requesting any sort of a variance or consideration or exception there. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Thank you, commissioners. Good questions. Okay. Um, how many speakers do we have on this item? Uh, we have 11 that are in opposition. We have 16 that registered just opinions in support of. So we have 11 speakers in opposition. That is correct. Okay. Um, let's, let's try to keep it to a couple of minutes each. I, I don't know if, uh, only because, again, we don't have a lot of leeway here. So um, let's try to keep it to two minutes per speaker. And with that, I'll open the public hearing and we'll call the first speakers. But as she calls your name, please come down front so that we're not waiting on you to come from the back of the room when you're, it's your turn to speak. I'm going to call four. Uh, Dan Killian is first. 
And next, uh, seated down in front, uh, Tanya Biggs, Larry Gretzka, and David Bobbs. Boobs. Thank you. Please state your name and address. Good evening. I'm Dan Killian, and my address is 5841 Bedrock Drive. I'm a member of the Stone Lake, Stone Lake Estates HOA Board Appointed Committee you're hearing from tonight. My wife and I were active at St. Andrew for many years. We know Robert Hasley well. He baptized both of our children. As I have personally told Robert, we have him and his family in our prayers. I feel confident the proposed development is much larger and more harmful to its neighbors than Robert would have ever envisioned or wanted. Since learning of St. Andrew's plans quite accidentally, by way of a social media post, our HOA and our committee have been hard at work, hoping to retain our basic right to quiet enjoyment of our properties and hoping to minimize destruction of the hard-earned equity we have in our homes. Following good advice we received along the way, our committee worked hard to find issues with the church's plans. On Wednesday, December 1st, we met with city staff. The first thing we did is we asked city staff to keep everything discussed in the meeting strictly confidential. We asked that nothing discussed that day be shared with St. Andrew or its agents. City staff agreed to this request. We then called into question whether the floor level elevation in St. Andrew's plans was correct. You can appreciate this is a focal point for us given the fact this very large structure is going to tower over our neighborhood, which scares us to death. City staff replied, this gets into a gray area. After the meeting and without contacting us again, city staff researched this issue, learned that in fact it is not a gray area, determined that St. Andrew's plans were not approvable with respect, with respect to floor elevation, floor level elevation, advised St. Andrew's engineer of this, then sent our committee an email letting us know St. Andrew was revising its plans so that they would conform. As a result, it is our understanding from city staff that the plans in front of you tonight meet floor level elevation requirements. Mr. Killian, your two minutes are up. May I continue? I will, keep up, it, I will keep it brief. This was very unfair to Stone Lake Estates. Were it not for the breach of confidentiality, Stone Lake Estates would be standing before you tonight telling you that floor level, floor level elevation is an open issue and city staff would have had no choice but to agree with this assessment and we assume city staff would have then recommended a tabling of this request to December 20th. Why does this matter, you ask? It matters a great deal because starting last Wednesday night and continuing into this past weekend, media outlets began to report that St. Andrew is willing to work with Stone Lake Estates. This is a very positive development and Stone Lake Estates looks forward to productively working with St. Andrew. So our committee and our board president worked hard over this past weekend and we were able to send to St. Andrew first thing this morning, a list of requirements in order for St. Andrew to gain the support of Stone Lake Estates and the HOA. It's not realistic to think St. Andrew could have worked through this list by seven o'clock tonight. And so what should have been a mandatory delay to December 20th anyway, will work, will now work in everyone's benefit. This seems very straightforward to us. Delay this request to December 20th. This will give St. Andrew time to work through the list. It will allow Stone Lake Estates and St. Andrew sufficient time to work together in a constructive way. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Tanya Biggs. I'm Tanya Biggs. I live at 1413 Tree Farm Drive in Plano. And I'm the Director of Planning and Zoning on the HOA Board and a committee member of the Board Appointed Committee. When I think of a chapel, I think of this as a chapel. This is uh, 2,800 square feet. I also think of the one in, in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, that's 1,440 square feet. I do not think about an 8,000 square foot building um, that they're, St. Andrews is calling a conference center, but is really a, uh, rather they're calling it a chapel, but it's really a conference center. I mean, it's huge, it's enormous. This is our view from this. It is so big, it cannot be screened. In their own, uh, uh, recruitment materials for fundraising. They call it a conference center. This 
is expected by the St. Andrew materials to be the most heavily used facility on, on the campus. So we will hear our residents, every car door lock, beep beep, every car door slam, and all of the traffic that's going to come right in the shadow of our homes. I want to talk a minute about the zoning. This is SF7 zoning. The purpose and intent is to protect our homes from excessive noise, illumination, and visual clutter. And clearly, this does not not protect us. We understand that they're a religious facility. We understand. But when you look at allowed uses under SF7, almost nothing is allowed. It is blank all the way down pages and pages. No office buildings are allowed. A whole bunch of other things that would be comparable use. So we consider you have this 25 seconds. a failure of zoning to not consider a mega church like St. Andrew's desire for income producing property and their lack of concern for a harm for their neighbors. If they were concerned about us, they would have reached out to us in their pre-planning process like the city asked them to do, like they ask everybody to do. We're asking you for the future, because we don't know what they're going to do next, Ms. to Biggs, change the zoning. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, next we have Larry Gretzka. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. <laughs> Please state your name and address. Hi, yeah, I'm Larry Grexis, and I uh, live at uh, 5849 Pebblestone Lane in Plano. Uh, I am currently the president of Stone Lake Estates Homeowners Association. Um, so starting, our board met last month and uh, uh, unanimous, unanimously uh, opposed the development um, over here at St. Andrew. Uh, we appointed a commission, number of people speaking here today to work through these issues and see if we can come some, to some compromise with St. Andrew. Uh, and we sent an urgent uh, notice out to our community, letting people know this was going on. As was pointed out, uh, we had no idea that this construction was going to be taking place. Um, so far, other than the one comment about uh, we've started to work with the uh, church uh, very recently, uh, to this point, the church never reached out to us to make any progress along these areas. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is point out an item to you that I think is most concerning to our neighborhood. We talked about the elevation that was presented to you a moment ago. Uh, the reality is the scale here, and there's a, there's a photo up here of how this is going to look to us uh, in Stone Lake Estates. Uh, this is a building that's going to ultimately be between 40 and 45 feet above the ground level of those people that live in Stone Lake, Stone Lake Estates. The height of the building is going to be approximately 37 feet, and they are going to have to do about six foot of backfill to level the land that it's on because of concerns about safety and security. The, the fire department would not be able to get to the building as if it is on a lower level. You have 25 <clears throat> seconds, sir. Okay. Um, so let me just close by saying this. Is this something that that uh, Pastor Hasley would really want to do, uh, impacting their, negative, their neighbors negatively like this. Uh, there's gonna be an impact to our uh, home value of this having this very large uh, building next to us. Um, and uh, is this really what he would do and what the church really wants to do? Your two minutes are up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker, please. Well, uh, David Bubas comes to the podium. Um, can I have Doyle Lessenfeld, Diane Reese, Eric Reese, and Elaine Stebbins come and have a seat? That's why we should have our three minutes because they're not speaking. You guys said 11, we had six. Okay. Uh, go ahead, sir. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dave Bubas. <clears throat> and I live at 5840 Bedrock Drive in Plano. I've been a next door neighbor to St. Andrew Church, and by next door, I mean 45 feet from the property line. A next door neighbor for 28 years. That's a long time neighbor in anybody's book. I've endured three different disruptive building programs over the course of those 28 years, but none of those will even come close to shattering my family's peaceful enjoyment of our home like this one will. And the reason is simple. It's way too big and it's way too close. Our HOA committee has been told several times 
that if this project meets the zoning code, the law says you all will have no choice but to approve the project. Well, my message to you tonight is also very simple. If this is what the law allows, the law, the zoning ordinance, has failed us. The church of all people has also failed us by not once reaching out to ask how their neighbors of 20 plus years felt about what they were intending to do. If there's one thing that I heard time and time again watching the proceedings about Haggard Farm, it was that this commission commended the developer for reaching out multiple times to the affected neighbors to ask, what can we do to make this better? That has not happened one single time in this case. Allow me to read a few of the notes and quotes I wrote down during the Haggard discussion on November 15th in this very room. One of you said to the developer, it's obvious you made a concerted effort to work with your neighbors. Another of you said, I appreciate the partnership you formed with the neighbors. One of you said to your fellow commissioners, the developer has demonstrated that it is a good neighbor. Wow, I can only conclude our neighborhood got really unlucky. This whole thing is not complicated. It's just plain wrong. All I can do is shake my head in utter, in utter disbelief that a church would do this to thy neighbor. Just because somebody's got the right to do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Please do the right thing. If the law says you cannot disapprove it, then table it until the parties involved have enough time to agree on a solution acceptable to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in light of the fact that we're only five speakers, if someone who has already spoken, we're certainly gonna go to three minutes, but I'll give you a lot of latitude, okay? <laughs> Who's next? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next is Doyle Listenfeld. If I may start when my fun slide goes. I need to find my fun slide. Would you mind stating your name and address for yes, the Yes, my name please? is Doyle Liesenfeld. I am the property owner of 5845 Bedrock, which would be one house away from my dear neighbor, Dan Killian, who lives adjacent to the proposed site. Okay, myself and my neighbors are in favor of honoring Pastor Hasley. Myself and my neighbors are in favor of this chapel. What we are not in favor of is this chapel in this location. The church is going to build a 45 foot tall, 9,000 square foot building, 45 feet from its adjacent neighbor's home, building to building. Never in the history of West Plano has a church building 45 feet high been placed this close to a single family resident and neighborhood. I did a survey of 28 churches in West Plano. I went on the PNZ website, went building to building. The average setback church to its nearest neighbor is 151 feet. Here, it is approximately 45 feet. This PD was approved decades ago, and I believe was never intended to place a 45-foot high building this close to a residential. The Planning and Zoning Board here today would never allow this condition to happen if the PNZ was, had a PD today in this condition. There's no one in this room or any other Plano resident that would want to live this close to a 45 foot high, 9,000 foot building. Now, what's 45 feet? If you take this column and go straight to that column, that's 42 feet. So that's almost from Mr. Killian's, when he comes out of his house, to the new proposed church site. If you look up to where that roof line meets this wall, that's 30 feet. At another 15, this is what Mr. Killian gets to go look at. I'm his next door neighbor. I will see this building. I'm shown a proposed site from the church on this aerial, and I'm also showing a proposed relocation. This is a plan that our civil engineer put together that shows, in fact, this building can be put on the Mira Vista side, giving all fire access, all easements, all setbacks, everything that a civil engineer would know is correct and true. 
to have this 9,000 foot building place. And more importantly, this, this is their view corridor from our proposed site. This is a magnificent view corridor. This will enable them to have their goal, which is to see straight out their chapel and see this beautiful westerly view overlooking the hill, the pond, the fountain, and the crosses. The proposed relocation, thank you ma'am, the proposed relocation will have zero impact on neighbors real estate value. It will also allow the chapel to have a direct view on these beautiful pieces of property. It's a sad day in West Plano when property owners lose value while the rest of the city is seeing the highest run up of re real estate values in its history. Love thy neighbor as yourself and God bless America. Thank you sir. Thank you. Are there more speakers? There are no more speakers. There are no more speakers. Okay. Um, the applicant usually has a few minutes to, if they want to respond to any of the statements that were made. I just have a few brief remarks um, um, regarding the let me see the building height. Um, so we'd seen the 46 there um, with clarification as, as we always do. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a, of a grading um, as, a, as the building tapers down to the north. So that's why that change came in uh, somewhat late. You know, the fire departments reviewed and approved this plan. We've reviewed three or four times with staff to make sure that what you have tonight is in compliance um, with every item in the zoning ordinance. Um, I think that's all that I wanted to mention there. Um, and so, yeah, we would respectfully request your approval of the sign of the night. Be happy to address any questions you might have for us to join us. I'll just say, <clears throat> lastly, um, we have every every time we've met with the neighbors, we've committed to them that we want to um, work with them on screening and other items. Um, and we're going to continue doing that. The, the list of things that they sent us uh, this morning to look at that they mentioned a uh, tabling this meeting for, um, all those things on that list are things that we can discuss with them as neighbors, but I don't see any of them uh, being at, within the scope of what we're asking to be approved tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You have a question? Yes. Uh, I actually, I have two questions. First of all, uh, after you've heard the discussion tonight, are you at all inclined to consider uh, an alternate location, or is this a is this a firm decision? This and this is your spot. Yes, sir. And, and honestly, all the the conversations that we've heard tonight are the same things we've talked about with the neighbors over the last um, three meetings, and um, you know. It's not my decision, but uh, as a leadership of St. Andrew with the committees and, and the church uh, representatives, it's been decided that this is the proposed, the proposed spot that we're presenting is going to be the spot of the chapel. Second question then for the engineer. Can you tell me, is it possible or not possible to build this chapel at the proposed uh, second location? Is it possible? Uh, certainly it's possible. Yes, sir. You know, is it ideal? for the client, for the church? No, sir. But, um, you know, you have to weigh, uh, you know, the vision, you know, this, this view that we're seeing on the screen, uh, what you don't see if you zoom back is there's about an eight foot grade drop. And so you don't have the access to get down to nestle next to the lake like you do on the other side. You know, the location they showed, just guesstimating, loses about 60 parking spaces. One of the other concerns we hear from neighbors and have the church has heard over the years is that there's just a lot of traffic and so we're you know it's part of the give and take could you build it there yes you could is it the ideal for us no sir it's not thank you thank you right. mr Raleigh. <clears throat> yeah actually i answered one of my questions regarding because i was going to go with the parking spaces could you quantify how much more of a burden it would be to build in the proposed relocation side yeah, I, you know, put it in percentages, you don't have to give me exact <coughs> financial dollars, but how much more of a burden versus the current site that you're proposing would that be? I guess I'm not sure I follow you. You're talking about a parking burden or? No, no, just well, in, in general. The, in, and let me, let's mm -hmm. just, 
I think we're getting a little in the weeds here. Where the building they've designed is per code, right? It so is. really, our, our really our discussion at this point is is a little bit ap academic. We're not going to be able to require them to go somewhere else. So uh, just I, I guess I would say let's not get too far into parking and other things because that's all meet, met, meets code. Agreed. Agreed. I was just trying to essentially said for the record that they went through on their own a sort of a, a business case analysis to understand and landed on this spot as the best for the property owner, which is um, the church, uh, applicable for the uses that they, um, they want to use it for. That just wanted to get to that point. And it's really hard to put a percentage on it. You know, mm -hmm. the, the site that was selected is the ideal. It fits the vision. It fits the mission of the facility. Um, and the, the other site that the, the neighbors had suggested, it, technically it does work to Mr. Stone's point, but it was not in keeping with the vision of the project. Anything else, Commissioner Riley? Just had one follow-up question for the engineer, just a matter of clarification. What is the finished floor of this building compared to the adjacent neighbors, roughly? Given it, and I the didn't same, mean, above or below? Uh, it's, it's approximately a foot above. So we had taken survey shots out there uh, the gentleman's drive, and I'm sorry, I'm not check my notes. Mr. Killian, uh, that lives next door to us, his top of curb elevation going into his driveway is approximately a 39.2. The finished floor of the building is 40.5, so we're about a 1.3 feet to the finished floor from the curb at the gentleman's home. I'm assuming his home is slightly above that, but we didn't get onto his property to do the survey. Right. So it's it's within about a foot. Thank you. Okay, since we're done there, I will close the public hearing and we'll combine discussion to the commission. I just remind us that our job isn't to determine the best location for it uh, or anything along those lines. It's really, does it meet code? They're building within their right. Um, let's just not get off into the weeds a little bit here. Commissioner Horn. Yes, um, you all understand administratively right now that somewhat our hands are tied because of what they proposed is to code with setbacks, et cetera. But I was one of the ones originally when Haggard West was proposed that the designers collaborate with the neighbors. And I think that there's strength in collaboration. I think the church wants to have could be a good neighbor. And uh, I think that what I'd like to propose is that we table this to the January 3rd meeting that allows the architects. We can't. We can't. That would be past the 30 day uh, shot clock. So, so it would have the, to be just at the next meeting. Okay, so then it would be the next asked. meeting, which would be the 20th? December 20th. December 20th. So that would allow uh, time for the, the church and the designers to meet with Mr. Killian and his neighbors and see or to determine some median ground that allow you to still have your vision of where you want to place it but again be respectful of the neighbors at the same time so we we really have choice here we either approve it as it is or we have we extend it and have more collaboration and we we revisit this so that's really kind of our approach so let's just so that everyone's clear before we go down that path um tabling it Great, we table it. They're under no obligation to go meet with the homeowners, and we're still sitting here on December 20th, still with our hands tied administratively and voting on this. Okay, so um, I, I'm less inclined to go that direction only because, as the applicant has said, the homeowners have made the same request every time, and it doesn't seem like they've found the middle ground. The homeowner or the applicant realizes they don't have to do anything, so I'm not sure that we buy anything other than media time over the next two weeks. But just so we're clear, everyone understands, if we table this, there is nothing that says that what's not gonna happen on December 20th is we're gonna have the exact same situation we have here and ultimately probably the exact same vote we would have if we don't table. Okay. Commissioner Kerry. Yeah, I, um, I, your points are well made. Um, I guess I, I'm, I'm going to uh, align a bit with Commissioner Horn in the, in the spirit of uh, of people doing the right thing and, and working together. And so while it may be likely that we come back here in two weeks and the church is gonna do exactly 
what they, they, they're going to do tonight, possibly they do find some middle ground with a little bit more time to look at it. And, um, you know, for me, as I listen to the comments on why the site is the perfect site, and, and it's certainly your site to choose, a lot of them have to do with the aesthetics of the building and, and the benefit of the church. And it seems as if possibly, as a church, you've ignored the benefits to your adjacent citizens. And my guess is, based on what I know about the church, is I, I don't think that's what you really want to do. So I don't know. I, maybe nothing changes, but I guess uh, hoping it, maybe at this time of year some good spirit comes through and um, we find a few more things. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, side, notwithstanding your, Understood. I think, wise comments, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to side with Commissioner Horn on this one, my, my two cents. Okay, so why don't we do this in the interest of time? I think we all have our, our deals. So are you wanting to make a motion to table? I'd like to make a motion that we table this, allow the applicant time to collaborate with the immediate neighbors, and we re revisit this on um, December, 20th. December 20th. I will second that. Okay, so we have a motion in a second before we go to the vote. For clarification, does this change their time clock or anything else? What is the impact by tabling this to the 20th? Assuming that on the 20th, no changes are made and it's approved uh, as an administrative item. Yeah, there's, there's no impact from a legal perspective. Um, we'll be within the 30-day shot clock from the day that they filed the application. Okay. We can't table anymore after the 20th because um, if we don't take action to approve or deny on the 20th, it's automatically approved by law. Okay. So just so that we're all clear on that. So we have a motion to table until December 20th by Commissioner Horn. We have a second by Commissioner Carey. So this is a vote yes, which is to table it. A vote no is to uh, move forward. And that item carries by a vote of four to three. So this item will be tabled until December the 20th. Good luck. Agenda item 2A and 2B will be read together. Agenda item number 2A is a public hearing zoning case 2021-015 request to rezone 2.9 acres located at the northeast corner of 15th Street and M Avenue from urban residential to planned development urban residential. Agenda item number 2B is a concept plan Elmwood Park Block A, lots 1 through 11, Block B, lots 1 through 10, and Block C, lots 1 through 5. 26 urban residential lots on 2.4 acres located at the northeast corner of 15th Street and M Avenue, zoned urban residential. Applicant is TWCP Westheimer Wilcrest Limited. Good evening, Commission. I'm Eric Hill, Senior Planning Manager. This zoning request before you this evening was submitted under the interim comprehensive plan. The request is to propose a compact single family development on an infill property. The property is surrounded by residential uses and zoning on all sides with the exception of existing commercial uses to the west and the future reuse of the chapel on the former First Baptist Church property to the south. This aerial shows the property is partially developed with the former parking lot, which was utilized by the church prior to the development proposed to the south. The associated concept plan shows 26 detached residential units with two internal streets. The property is designated as residential on the land use map and is in conformance with the recommendations of the interim comprehensive plan. This case has been delayed several times, and we wanted to discuss that briefly with you. It's gone through various changes based upon discussions with staff and the applicant. Compared to the initial request, this current request before you has been adjusted to have a reduced density, have larger lots with more open area, uh, have reduced in reductions in building height, and also reductions in the amount of right-of-way, which ultimately reduces the city's long-term maintenance costs on the property. 
This slide shows the original design for the concept plan on the left as compared to the current design. The layout is similar, but includes, again, less right of way, and there are changes to the lots, uh, especially within the northern portions of the property, which are adjacent to existing residences. The proposed plan development standards are intended to allow a transitional product between the existing residences to the north and the townhome residences to be built to the south across 15th Street. In addition to the changes in this slide, the applicant is also requesting changes in, uh, per the development standards related to access, additional protections for existing residences, as well as updates to yard regulations and fencing standards. The zoning ordinance requires plan development districts to be a minimum of five acres in size. A PD may be established smaller than five acres if a finding is made by city council that the establishment of the district is required to implement the comprehensive plan or related study. The subject property is 2.9 acres and is landlocked due to existing development and streets. This zoning request is in alignment with all associated comprehensive plan policies. And although development could occur according to the existing zoning, the request will provide additional housing variety which is a goal specifically stated within various comprehensive plan policies, as well as the city's downtown vision and strategy update and the housing trends and strategic plan report, which were both reviewed and provided analysis for within your staff report. Additionally, the request is consistent with the purposes of plan development districts, which are stated in Article 12 and are shown on the slide before you. And these are intended for the betterment of the community. Um, PDs should also positively contribute to the surrounding area and help achieve the overall development goals of the community. The applicant's requested standards are intended to respect the existing residences to the north while accommodating innovation by modifying regulations to create a new housing product that aligns with the city's policy goals. And regarding public response, we did receive two responses in opposition to this request within 200 feet. In total, we received eight responses, two in support and six in opposition, and there was one duplicate response. And due to the um, requirement for PD districts, we have a recommendation as follows, that we recommend, staff recommends approval of this request, subject to city council finding the establishment of the plan development district is required to implement the comprehensive plan, the downtown vision and strategy update, and or the housing trends and strategic plan report and also recommended for approval with the plan development standards as noted in your staff report. I'd be glad to answer any questions and the applicant is here and has a presentation to make. Thank you, Eric. Uh, questions for Eric on this? Commissioner Horn. Uh, Eric, I, looking at this and looking at comments, I went back and checked that uh, a, a large portion of this, or actually about 40, 45% of the property lies within the Clint Foreman addition of the neighborhood conservation district um, is that correct uh, also part considered part. old town part of, there's a formal old town and then there's this clint foreman addition that's where uh especially where the green space is i'm sorry your question is the, the responses that we received were those received from old town well What's actually that? i was one that when i reviewed it i saw that again they were saying that part of this was going to be in the uh, neighborhood conservation. Uh, right, I believe you're referring to the heritage plan and the Clint Foreman addition. Um, that's not formally designated as a conservation area. I think it's recommended as a conservation area in the heritage plan. So um, there's not uh, a formal designation as a conservation district on this property right now. Okay. With that being said, it's not formally, but it, it's a conservation move, right? Is that correct? Um, in the heritage preservation, perhaps Mike would do, I'm going to ask Mike Bell, the comprehensive planning manager who is over the heritage preservation plan to come down and address these issues more specifically. That's Ms. Ms. Day is correct. This is not has has no formal designation of any kind in terms of heritage or neighborhood conservation. It is recommended by the preservation plan that this in this area, the old town in general, 
If you looked at it more closely, we have recently approved the Neighborhood Conservation District Ordinance, which would allow it to have some additional protections. But even that says at the initiation of the neighbors and their interest. So we'll not be moved forward by the city. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ratliff, I think you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Eric, a couple of questions. Um, we've had some challenges with parking in neighborhoods that have used streets. I noticed a couple of questions on this one. On the uh, staff's uh, report, it says that there's a 20 foot setback for garages in accordance with the BG district. But on the site plan, it shows 20 feet setback from the pavement. Is it 20 foot from the property line or 20 foot from the pavement? Uh, in this instance, it's from the pavement. That's a standard in the downtown business government district, which the applicant is applying to this property. So it is from the pavement. Okay, so it's effectively 17 from the property line, if the, assuming the road's in the center of the right Correct. Way. Okay, but still enough room to put a car in the driveway. That's correct, and okay. outside of the fire lane within okay. the streets. Okay, well, that was my next question. So is this going to be uh, subject to the, the new policy uh, to require striping and or signage on the Mew streets designating them as fire lanes? Yeah, it's actually already on the concept plan to be uh, striped as fire lanes. So we did okay. already take care of that issue. Okay, I didn't see I didn't see that in the fine print. I had my, my bigger glasses with me. So. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, one question regarding the height, the max height. There, I saw on one of the slides says it could be three stories. Maybe I was misreading that. Could it be three stories? It is allowed, or it has to be two stories? Uh, or it's not less than two stories. Right. It's not required to be two stories. To be three stories. There's the flexibility in houses which front on 15th Street. Um, and in Avenue, that those can be three stories and 38 feet. So there's flexibility, but where you move closer to the existing homes on the north side, those are restricted to two stories and 35 feet for those properties. Okay, so for this property on one side, it could be three story, on the other side, it's two story. Is that my understanding correct? Right, if you're looking at it, it's kind of like a, this shape along mm -hmm. 15th Street and then in, uh -huh. those can be three stories and 38 feet. Okay. And then the other portions would be two stories. Okay, got you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to just ask when you're speaking, kind of lean forward a little bit, just, uh, and, and you're not, I, I was forever, when I was first served on council and on PNZ, my wife would say, speak into the microphone. So just, uh, so, and, and you're very soft spoken already. So for the, those that are listening, it's, it's helpful. Uh, Commissioner Ali. Uh, quick question. The current, um, zoning for, for the property, um, the green space that is there right now. Can it be built in, in field under the current zoning or would our change to this new zoning essentially allow them to build into that green space? Uh, the existing zoning is urban residential. It's a residential zoning district. So someone could um, buy that property, subdivide it for individual yeah. residential lots and build on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Kerry. Yeah, Eric, just a couple questions. One, can you remind us um, what's immediately to the south? I think there are some new things going in there. Uh, that's my first question. Yes, it's the, the old First Baptist Church property. There's a redevelopment of that property that's ongoing. The majority of the 15th Street frontage is going to be townhomes. Um, and then at the corner of 15th and M is the old chapel, and that's going to be reused as office space. Okay, There's also a multifamily component and additional retail as you get closer to 15th. Sorry, you know, 14th. Thank you. One, one of the things that uh, with this, it, it looks like, and some of the responses we got, some of the residents are using this space as a park. And mm -hmm. the church has a park sign out in front of it um, at this point, whether it's really designated officially a park, I guess, uh, has to be determined. But on page six of your notes, you talk about um, the capacity for parks in the area. And it looks like um, there aren't really um, park availability, there's not park availability close to this property. And so some of the residents talked about giving up some of this open land. And do you have comments on that? Um, so there are parks in the area, so that's what we included here. The Haggard Park, which is to the west, um, which is a walking distance, as well as Willow Creek to the north. So those are um, available and within proximity to the property. Um, this property was previously owned by the church. It's no longer owned by the church. So the, the 
property. The, the applicant tonight does currently own the property. Um, there was a consideration, um, and you may see that some of the comments uh, from the responses in the, in the report, um, sorry, set in the packet tonight, that uh, there's a question about parkland down here. This property was considered for parkland. Uh, council considered it about a year ago, um, but decided not to move forward with the purchase of the property for parkland. Um, so it's currently, although it is open space, a portion of it. I think there's been community gardens there and, and you know, mm -hmm. various things like that for recreation. It is currently owned and is intended to be developed. So I think that the, the parks in the area are sufficient for the additional homes that are here. Yeah, but I'm, I guess I'm reacting to the Haggard Park to the west, which is mm -hmm. at capacity with existing residential developments. Yep. Seems in conflict with that. So maybe I'm misinterpreting that. No, and I think the, again, the park, the parks department has it within their master plan and their goal is to acquire more park space within the downtown area. This was a property that was identified, but again, it was not moved forward. So I think, you know, there, uh, that's what we stated in here. So the parkland that we have right now, kind of, it is what it is. Um, this property could develop with, with homes, um, but to, at this time, it's proposed to vote Great. as it is tonight. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one more question, Mary. Um, the road, a road. I see that there are two private roads within the community. Yes. Is there any requirements from planning and zoning to provide some kind of detail lane before they turn into the community? No, not for those mm -hmm. uh, those residential roadways. There's no detail requirement. The uh, the speeds and the, the trips uh, generated by this development would not require a desal lane. Okay, thank you. One one more follow up question on parking: Is there going to be street parking on Fifteenth M or N? So there is. Um, the, the rights of way are big enough, large enough on M and N to accommodate some on-street parking. The city has a CIP project that they're working on on 15th Street. Um, there will be additional parking added to the south as well as to the north um, along this property. So there will be on-street parking availability. Okay, so there'll be some visitor parking That's for those residences right in front of their homes That's correct. for most of them. Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, uh, just a comment. Uh, I was just encouraged to look and see the changes that have been made already in terms of reducing heights and increasing setbacks. So I was, I was happy to see that. Okay, no more questions for staff? Uh, is the applicant here to speak on this item? Yes, ma'am. Audra Buckley? Good evening. Audra Buckley, 1414 Bellevue Street, Suite 150, Dallas, Texas, 75215, representing the property owner in this case, and I also represented the property owner. It's the same one, it's just a different entity, but it's the same property owner who's developing the property to the south that you just inquired about with the chapel and the townhomes. So, as you know, this is the site, and here is a proposal. This is where we started. Um, this was the very first plan that we submitted, and obviously uh, this did not work uh, due to the front entry garages that they showed on M Avenue. The staff didn't like it. Honestly, uh, we didn't like it um, after we looked at it, and the neighborhood definitely didn't like it. We decided to try to do 50 feet height along 15th Street originally. But that was problematic for the neighborhood, and the reason we had we had looked at doing the 50 feet originally is because we had 50 foot townhomes on the south side. But considering that this is um, an area that's in transition, you really wanted something that's a little more transitional here rather than something quite as large as what was on the south side. So we came up with this plan. This also dropped down to 26 units here, and we worked with staff to come up with this one, but then when we ran it through all the different departments with staff, we found out that this layout did not work either because we had dead-end alleys. Fire, sanitation, mm -hmm. had nowhere to turn around. Mm -hmm. So then we took this plan to the neighborhood after we got uh, staff and engineering and everybody's blessing with this one. Uh, these interior lots are two-story. The ones along 15th and N, even though the height is 38, they're actually two and a half story. There'll be some rooftop decks on the 15th Street and the N Avenue and the back portion of it will be covered. 
Um, so that's where the three story is coming from. The Plano code does not recognize two and a half. Mm -hmm. So the roof decks, as I said, they're only permitted on the 15th and in Avenue and the property owner in this one is also the property owner to the east on the east side of N Avenue. So here's what it looks like if you color it up where you can actually see some green. Uh, we wanted to have double car garages where they could actually have two cars park out on the pad as well. And we also show uh, the improvements the city intends to make along 15th Street. You were asking about parallel spaces and we illustrate that here. There are a couple of bump outs on the end and uh, I believe the neighborhood is going to be asking the city to consider putting another bump out in the center with some large trees to provide a, a little bit of a breakup. So here was our initial request. We started out with 28, we ended out with 26. Our, our lot coverage dropped to 60%, lot areas at 3,000. Again, the height dropped uh, from the 50 feet to the 38. It's actually two and a half stories, but we'll call it three. Front yard setback, we're back up to the 10 feet and the lot width at 30 feet. We had quite a bit of community engagement on this one. Uh, we met with them on three separate occasions and each time they had a lot to say to us about the appearance of it, how it was accessed, the parking, and we also had email updates, formal email updates that went out to everybody. This was our first attempt at a facade that nobody liked. Um, the neighborhood shot that down within about five minutes of it being on screen. <laughs> so we tried it again. Uh, we tried with this one, and this one didn't get much traction because if you'll notice, there are porches on some of the units, and there is a walk up to some of the units with no door. So I'm not quite sure what the designer was thinking on this one, but this failed. And then we finally landed on this one. Uh, if you'll notice on each of the units that are facing the public rights of way, we have the porches there, then that's going to help provide the visual separation between the public and the private space. So, and then this, this next bit here is something the neighborhood had asked for is just making sure that when you, uh, when you did the 15th to consider putting in another bump out with some large planting in each one of them and these little islands and then also the continuation of the pedestrian scale street lighting that's already in downtown. So with that, um, that's it for my part of the presentation. So, all right, is there somebody else that's presenting or no? Well, I have someone here that can answer technical questions. All Phyllis right. Gerald is here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I bet she but can answer not, the technical questions. She's not going to speak unless there are questions. All right. Are there questions for the applicant on this? Commissioner Stone. I have a quick comment. I, I really appreciate the work that you've done on your facade here. It would be a very interesting look on 15th Street. I, I hope other developers that have come through this body over the last few months working on this kind of a project would take the same approach, but you're to be commended for the for the elevations and also the fact your lot coverage is really good at 60%. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Or rather, let's go questions. We'll get to comments here. Nope. Very good. All right. I will open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. Okay. Well, that we will close the public hearing and combine discussion to commission. Well, I certainly like what you've done with your the facade here. The conceptual plan is outstanding. You're seeing a lot of architectural relief and variations. So I think it's something that 15th Street and the rest of that community, from an infill perspective, is really going to applaud. So this is something I think is uh, just spot on for what we're looking for. And um, I do also applaud you for uh, reducing the number of units, but I see where how the process happened and also increasing the lot size. So I think it's nothing but positive here. Thank you. Commissioner Kerry. Yeah, I, I have to echo what the fellow commissioner said. I think this would be a nice addition to this area. Yeah. You've done some excellent work and I, I think it's a, a good project based on what I see here. Anyone else? I'll... Um... I mean, when I first looked at this, particularly the very first house there on the right, I thought, wow, that's like New Orleans, right? You got the balconies and the upper deck. Uh, maybe we'll get the 4th of July parade to come down 15th Street and these people can sit up there and wave and stuff. So excellent. Uh, or a Mardi Gras, we can create a Mardi Gras parade. Um, so excellent, uh, excellent work there. 
Um, there's a lot of uh, language in here from a staff standpoint. So I'm uh, thinking from a motion standpoint, the simplest thing to do is I would make a motion to approve subject to staff's recommendations. Is that sufficient? I'll second. And we have a second by Commissioner Stone. So a motion to approve item 2A by myself, a second by Commissioner Stone. Please vote. And that item carries by a vote of seven to zero. And now we, 2B was presented at the same time. So I'll make a motion to approve uh, item 2B subject to city council approval of zoning case 2021-015. I second. I have a second by Commissioner Tong. Please vote. And that item carries by a vote of seven to zero. Next item. Item 3A and 3B will be presented together. Agenda item number 3A is a public hearing zoning case 2021-025. Re request to rezone 6.7 acres located on the east side of Split Trail Road, 1,000 feet north of K Avenue from Corridor Commercial to a planned development Corridor Commercial to accommodate a service yard and future office professional slash administrative. Agenda item number 3B is a concept plan. H HQS edition, block A, lots one and two. Service contractor, open storage, and single family residence on lot one, and professional general administrative office on lot two, on 5.9 acres located on the east side of Split Trail Road, 1,000 feet north of K Avenue, zone corridor commercial. Applicant is HQS Construction, LLC. Good evening, everyone. This zoning request was submitted under the interim comprehensive plan. The current zoning of this property is corridor commercial, and the request is to change to plan development corridor commercial with plan development stipulations to add additional open storage. The subject property is surrounded by corridor commercial zoning on three sides, with the exception of the east, which is zoned light industrial one. Also, the property is surrounded by vacant or commercial property, with the exception to the west across Split Trail Road, which is a mobile home park development. The primary focus of the development request centers on the applicant's vision to expand the current service contractor business to include additional open storage. This is an aerial of the property. The property currently has existing an existing residence, multiple buildings, and open storage. The property adjacent to K Avenue is vacant. The subject property was previously zoned Light Industrial 1, and in 1999, City Council considered the rezoning of this property and surrounding properties. This property and the others were specifically considered to remain as Light Industrial for flexibility of uses and allowance of open storage. Council ultimately determined that corridor commercial zoning was the most appropriate zoning to maintain consistent zoning in the area to continue to beautify East Plano and to allow the existing businesses to remain, but to not expand. The property has a residential building that has been in place since 19, at least 1964, as evident by satellite imagery. The property is not platted, does not have an approved site plan, and has no record of certificates of occupancy for the current uses. The property has an extensive history of use with Property Standards Division of Neighborhood Services. Staff requested the owner to provide documentation of current open storage rights, but no such documentation has been provided. Scott Lucier with the proper, is the Property Standards Manager, is here tonight to answer any additional questions if requested. This leads staff to conclude that the property should conform fully to the corridor commercial zoning that is in place now and at the time of purchase by the applicant in 2009. This is the associated concept plan for the subject properties. Tract A includes the proposed service contractor with storage yard, related buildings, and an existing residential building. Tract B includes a future 21,000 square foot office building. The 
request is in the freeway commercial designation within the interim comprehensive plan. The freeway commercial designation is focused on general commercial, entertainment, lodging, and office designations, which intends to serve local needs with heights that are typically less than 20 stories and floor to area ratios of one to one. The expansion proposal on Tract A as the primary use is not consistent with the freeway commercial designation definition and would not positively contribute to the character of the corridor. Additionally, the city has urban design element guidelines that are, that are use specific. Outside storage is mentioned in theme two, city of organized development, major corridor development. And the outside storage proposed on the concept plan is inconsistent with the urban design elements. Additionally, a DART station is shown in the general area. This station is not fully defined and the final location is yet to be determined. Overall, the request for the additional outdoor storage is not consistent with the comprehensive plan. To add, the request is not inconsistent, is not consistent with the Envision Oak Point plan. The Envision Oak Point plan is a long range planning policy that presents the community's vision for a 730 acre segment of land serving Plano as serving as Plano's Northwest Gateway that was adopted in 2018. The expansion of open storage is inconsistent with all aspects of the transit ready development type within the Envision Oak Point plan. Tract B on the concept plan is within the eastern portion of the property and is inconsistent with character defining elements portion of the transit ready development type. The lack of east-west connectivity through the site is inconsistent with the map of network improvements. Mike Bell, the comprehensive planning manager, is here tonight if any additional questions arise. The property is proposed to be two tracks. The tracks pertain to the following plan development stipulation. Open storage is allowed within tract A with a maximum square footage of 49,000 square feet and storing on gravel surface. Open storage will not be permitted on tract B. Also, the existing and proposed buildings within tract A are exempt from the exterior wall construction standards. For some background, in 2017, the city undertook an effort to amend the zoning ordinance to clarify and improve its regulations for open storage. The effort focused on visual appearance, nuisances, and public health. When considering rezoning requests, the city should closely consider whether additional open storage meets the city's goals and be considerate of the long-term impacts it may have on the subject property and surrounding area. Open storage is defined as the keeping of outside goods, materials, containers, vehicles, trailers, and other equipment on a lot or tract. Within the existing corridor commercial zoning, open storage is allowed as an accessory use. It is restricted to a maximum of 5% of the total lot area or 20% of the main building gross floor area. Whichever is more restrictive is implemented. From the concept plan, the open storage is proposed at a maximum of 49,000 square feet, which is relatively equivalent to 37.3% of the total lot area and more than 1,000% of the main building's gross floor area. Additionally, open storage is required to be stored on a paved surface. The purpose for this requirement is due to various issues that arrive from storing materials on a gravel surface. The applicant is requesting an exemption from building materials requirements from the zoning ordinance. The city has created landscape alternatives and incentives that allow developers to choose to follow or not to follow these standards. Labeled on the concept plan, there are several existing buildings, including some metal storage buildings, and several proposed buildings, including a steel shop. Since there are already options for flexibility of these building materials in the zoning ordinance, staff is not supportive of the proposed plan development standard. This slide shows the exact wording taken from the zoning ordinance explaining that plan development requests are intended for the betterment of the community and should positively contribute to the surrounding area and help the help achieve the overall development goals of the community. And the request is not consistent with these plan development requests. We received a total of one response uh, before noon on Friday, December 3rd in support of the request. And we've received one in total. 
In summary, the request is not in conformance with the interim comprehensive plan and the proposal does not implement the community's vision laid out in the Envision Oak Point plan. The request also does not fulfill the purposes and intents plan development districts are as specified in the zoning ordinance. And therefore, staff is recommending denial of zoning case 2021-025. Additionally, due to staff's recommendation for denial of the zoning case, the recommendation for denial is associated with the concept plan 2021-016. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and the applicant is here tonight with a presentation prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for staff on this item? That was a mouthful. <laughs> Two or three. Um, okay. Uh, if we don't have any questions, if the applicant would like to uh, speak to the commission. Chairman, Commissioners, Maxwell Fisher with Master Plan 2595 Dallas Parkway, Frisco, Texas. Uh, 75034. Um, I've had some serious asthma this week, including some asthma this evening, so um, bear with me. This could be a pretty rough presentation compared to my normal presentation, but um, I'm here, uh, so I appreciate it. We're representing HQ, HQS. We also have HQS family members here to answer any questions that I can't answer. The family's been in business since the 1980s. They were formerly Iricon Construction. Um, the family's been on the current site since 2008, um, and understand there's there's it's you're kind of probably asking questions. How did this? How did these? How did they get here? You know, how did they get here without a, C, a permanent CO? And the answer is that they when they purchased the property um, over a decade ago, there were about 14 different tenants on this property, different subcontractors. And when they bought the property, the gentleman was um, not from. United States, and so he bought it. He thought he could just continue to run, run um, what had been, you know, the tenants had been there. <clears throat> Over the years, there's been um, several issues with um, co-compliance and that sort of thing, and a lot of those, ten all those tenants have left, except for um, there's a, there's a residential uh, house on the property um, today that that someone has lived there a long time, and it's been there since before the property, and so it's considered um, grandfathered in that respect. So. Um, but then when they landed the, the split trail um, construction project, then they actually applied for a temporary construction yard on the property, and it was approved by property standards back in 2013. There is some approval there. Um, now, they didn't come back on the other, on the other um, uh, approved bond projects, uh, construction projects, um, as they've moved forward, but they've, they've, and that's why we're here today is to ask for zoning to, so that way they feel comfortable with making serious investment, not only for their office headquarters and to expand the yard, um, but also for office on the, on the other track. If it's, if they can't have open storage, then obviously they would need to either move elsewhere or come up with other options. <clears throat> so they have a 10 year partnership with the city. They build underground utilities, new street construction, storm drainage, water lines, um, hike and bike trails. A lot of the, the things that you see that the planning department requires, um, but the city requires um, sidewalks, they, HQS builds a lot of those. They have 45 to 70 employees. A lot of the employees don't actually come to this property. There's not a lot of traffic there. Um, so, but there is a, obviously create a great economic benefit um, with with their uh, with their business. <clears throat> they provide uh, critical public infrastructure, um, and there's some reason why we're asking for some of the few of the variances that we're asking. But um, they, you know, they've worked on all sorts of projects over the years for the city of Plano, and there, there's a need for this type of business in Plano. I understand it has certain there's certain locations that it's appropriate, but they've worked on. Everything from uh, trail connections, bleachers, fire station. Um, they, they built split tra trail, as I mentioned, and several other sidewalks um, in the and, and, and hike and bike trails in the area. The subject property um, is what I feel is on the very southern end of of the of the master plan, the area plan, Oak Point plan. So. Um, there's a lot of uses around it that I think are uh, are, are challenges for um, even uh, visioning that plan and seeing that plan carried forth. You've got Living Earth, which is probably the most um, largest 
development um, to the north of us. It also has you know quite a bit of an odor, as any sort of business like that does with the composting. And then you have Neville Masonry Supply. You have um, another uh, Metro Masonry construction to the south of us, which also has, I think, is a non-conforming use uh, because of the amount of storage it has. And then you have, of course, self-storage. And there's actually, just south of Living Earth, there's um, a business that has what appears to be a nursery. Uh, but then behind it, there's construction materials just piled up there. So there, there are, this is a challenge area, but I think it's important to note that this, you know, this is an area that's industrial in, in some respects, or heavy commercial, and that what we're proposing will at least, it will look a lot better from the public's view and as necessary business um, uh, to provide the critical infrastructure. Here's a Metro Masonry to the south, shows some of the pictures. Um, Living Earth, they have all, just some pictures of the, of the uses around there. Um, here's a summary of what we're proposing. Uh, we are proposing to increase our outside storage um, uh, from 5% to 38%, and we're also planning to add um, a, basically, a, we have a building, uh, roughly 5,000 square foot building in the center. That would be for the repair, ancillary repair of our vehicles. Um, we have obviously all kinds of uh, different materials, uh, I'm sorry, all kinds of different equipment <clears throat> that um, is special for laying concrete. Um, so I, our, our request is simply that, you know, the contractor yard is allowed, I mean, the service contractor is allowed, and we're just asking to increase the storage somewhat, but we're, at, we're, we're willing to give, give it up on, on B. We wouldn't allow any, we basically prohibit storage on that, on that track. Here's just a summary of what we're proposing. We are proposing um, flex space for our storage areas, and I'll tell you why. We have equipment that if you store that equipment on the concrete, it will break the concrete up. And or it will tear up the finishing machines of the metal. So there's there's certain concrete finishing machines that we use, and you cannot put it on concrete. It's it's it lays the concrete, but it can't sit on hard concrete. So <clears throat> excuse me, that's what we're asking for that that variance. We're proposing to to make um, significant improvements to the property. We've added cross access with the help of staff. Um, we've added um, landscape buffers that also include grass area of the of the parkway, we'll have trees, we'll be adding some trees under the, the power lines we have there, um, some additional enhanced paving along our foundation. It will look significantly improved from what it looks like today. And then we'll also have screening around the entire property. You will not know there's, there's a storage yard behind there. You won't know there's 38% storage because we're gonna screen on all four sides um, around the property outside of the gate. So we're happy to put solid slats on the gates to also help the, help with that. <clears throat> Our open storage is listed there, is shown there in blue. Um, I think I'll move on. Sorry, wrong way. I just messed it up. There we go. Um, here's some existing photos of the site, some of the equipment that we have. Like again, we'll be replacing that fence and doing a nice landscape for irrigation, trees, heavy machinery I was speaking about while we're asking for the um, paving reduction. I want to address a little bit of the um, a couple comments in the staff report. Uh, one, it says that there are a lot of other options for this this owner. Well, there's it's easy to say when you when I used to work for the city, I you know, so I understand it's easy just to say things like this, but um, it's not easy for them to find a new site. They have to find a new site, and, and it has to be appropriate for screening. I mean, it's appropriate for, for outside storage. A lot of the, the light industrial areas you have in your city are built out. They're all large warehouses. Um, sometimes deed restrictions don't even allow outside storage. Um, so you know, out of the 5% um, zone industrial, I bet there's less than 0.5% that it would even be an option. Um, and by... Um, leaving the, the uh, contractor yard here, you're not introducing another yard elsewhere in the city. You're leaving it here, but screening it better. Some comments about Dart Line. Uh, you know, the, the Dart Line moving north um, of Parker is not in the plans of, of Dart. Um, you know, evidence by that is Allen and McKinney are not even in the member cities. Um, <clears throat> There's some discrepancies too uh, on where that that dart uh, station would go. It's most likely going to go near Spring Creek. It's not going to go south near our property. Um, so we feel our site is not going to disrupt everything that's going on north at Spring Creek. You got retail and other developments going on there. Our development won't disrupt transit oriented development in the north. 
Um, we don't feel that transnora development would ever be appropriate down here. Here's a couple other, I, I've kind of um, squared a blue area to show. That's really where I feel, I feel is the transnora needed core um, of the Envision Oak Point plan. We're not near Collin College. We're not near Plano Event Center. We're not near, or somewhat near the real preserve, but not really. I feel like we're in the area of the plan, we're not going to disrupt um, other transit oriented development opportunities to the north. Sorry, bear with me. I'm struggling for air. Um, so here's another plan. Um, that I, there's a couple projected DART stations <coughs> that were shown on the Envision Oak plan. This one actually showed one at Spring Creek and then one right by our site. I can't ever envision uh, why there, a DART would put a station that close together, you know, less than a half mile, um, when you have one that would be planned somewhere near Spring Creek, and then you've and, and you've had some other other plans here, I'll get into a couple other comments made. The lack of definitive plans uh, for the rail station shouldn't preclude short-term plans to develop the site with other uses, such as office or retail. We're proposing office on on plan on lot B. <clears throat> retail is largely dead. Retailers don't go; they would never go on a site like this. They like they want to go on Main and Main, um, which we're not anywhere near. Um, so I, I feel like those are those are a couple of misguided um, points. Um, the property is inconsistent with the char char character defining elements. The character defining elements of the plan are more form based um, and more um, higher density and form based development. Um, you're proposing a more standard development, but in the future, a yard could be easily scraped. It's not like a self storage facility where it's going to be there forever. The trailer park might be there forever, and the self-storage maybe, but this could be something that could be scraped, assembled, put together, doing a larger redevelopment for transit or endowment in the, in the unlikely event you had a transit station near here in the future. There are so many plans um, here. I, I, brought, I think it's the 86 plan is what you all are, uh, um, you know, is subject to this for this particular property. Um, it was in the freeway corridor district, I believe, freeway district. Um, I don't know if that was really a fair character um, classification. I mean, we're separated by from the highway from with a rail um, rail line, um, and then the the trailer park. Um, you know, it, we don't have any visibility of the highway. We have poor access. Um, again, even this plan shows we're really far from any dark station. So transit and oriented development again is not really. Um, and, and I think that the latest 2021 plan, you know, that you have, I think it's it's more reasonable. It shows a transit stop where it should be up at Spring Park, Spring Creek, and then and then to the south um, near Parker. That makes more sense. This site again is well well removed from that. We can screen ourselves. We can make ourselves look um, as good as we can as a yard, and we we, we provide a critical infrastructure uh, for the city. <clears throat> I'll wrap up here. Thank you for bearing with me in my um, ass here. Um, so again, this is a, a long-term business. We want to get right with the city. We want to get um, our, a, a permanent CO for this property. Um, we don't want to. We don't want to relocate elsewhere. We 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 love Plano. We want to be here. We want to be a, um, a, an upstanding um, operator um, in, in in line with all your codes. The only way we get comfortable doing that is if you approve the zoning tonight to a hat, so we can have 38% storage. That will allow us to make the inve investments to do subdivision planning. Um, provide sewer to the property. There's no sewer right now, it's septic. Um, there's a lot of challenges on Sprint Split Creek, Split Trail, and, and we're part of the solution um, with, with, by, by, by um, proving this request. Um, if we su support the request, it avoids us relocating elsewhere to a greenfield site. Um, there's several heavy, heavy commercial uses around us that are non-conforming. We just ask you to give us some, some leniency. We'll try to, we've tried to meet every code we can, except for the very few we're asking for variances on. Um, the Envision Oak Point plan calls for TOD very near our site. Again, I feel that's a misguided location for, for transitory development. We ask you to choose a business over what is shown on a plan, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, we've got a, he's anxious, Commissioner Stone. Take a breath and, and I'll uh, breathe a couple of minutes. I'm going to ask you two questions. Number one, uh, what percentage of the 38% open storage, what percentage of that 38 needs to be gravel and what percentage could be concrete? And then the second question is, what are specifically, what are the building material standards that you're asking to remove? 
Oh, thank you for, for asking that question. I missed that in my presentation. Let me answer that first, and then I may have to ask my client about the percentage. Um, so I had a little misunderstanding when I was working with the city, um, which is not uncommon for me. Um, but so I thought when we had an enhanced paving along split, um, enhanced landscaping along split trail, that we were exempt from building material requirements. But then I learned to find, I come to find out that I needed to do, we need to do enhanced um, landscaping along split trail, but then also around our perimeters, like a 10 foot landscape edge around both the north, the south, and the western. And when I learned that, and, and we wouldn't have done that anyway because it's a yard, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It makes more sense on a retail or office property. We have a lot of visibility, people coming out, and you have that appropriate buffer between properties. Um, so, long story short, we were going to do stone masonry on the front. Um, and, and, and then do metal on the other sides. But then when talking with staff, it's like, well, why don't you just ask for a full variant? So we, we did that um, because anyway, but the, the point is, is that we're willing to do some masonry if, if, that, if that's what the city wants. Because, because of our, the building's almost 200 feet back from Split Trail, and we're going to have not only trees, but we're gonna have an eight foot tall, uh, six to eight foot tall um, vegetative hedge along there. Um, you're not going to see much of the building, so that's why we didn't um, really put money into the into the masonry material, and it's a yard. But we are willing to do that if that's something that the commission is, um, is insists on doing. So and that was kind of a long answer. That's so, how we got there. So the building material standards you're talking about relate to the screen wall, not to a constructed building. No, it's the building. Yeah, the, no, it is the building. So we were going to actually have exterior masonry standards uh, materials for our building. Are you talking um, about tract A or B yeah, or Yeah, the tract A. I'll back up to the plan. I'll just point to it. So the large contractor service building, I say it's large. It's only 4,800 square feet. We were going to do masonry on the, on the western elevation. Okay. Um, and we're happy to still do that. Um, and again, we, we would actually be exempt from the standards if we did a 10-foot landscape edge around the property, but really we want that to be for our yard, um, which may be a good segue into your, your first So question. what material would you use on the other three sides? Um, we, we could do, we were going to do corrugated metal, but we're, we could do masonry for even more of it. Um, we, we could do a combination. Um, we could do a combination of masonry along the base, and then we could transition to, um, to something else. We could do all masonry. Okay. Um, it's not something that we're going to sit here and just dig our heels in okay. on. It just we did. It just didn't think it made sense because of the lack of visibility of that building, and it's so far. Away, it's two hundred feet away from the road. Okay. So concrete versus crushed rock on your open storage. How does that break down roughly? Um, I'd have to ask my client what percentage um, they're willing to live with, but I suspect that we could do some concrete if that's what um, the commission is looking for. Um, so if I could consult with them real quick sure. and ask them. Sure. Mr. Chairman, may he consult? Uh, Why don't we uh, just bring the conversation down to, okay, the, yeah. to the podium and <clears throat> sure. there may be other questions and rather than us doing a tag team here. So the, what we're discussing is that um, trying to determine the exact area that we need to accommodate the heavy machinery that cannot sit on concrete. Is it roughly half and half? Half concrete, it's half gravel? Name and address. Okay, uh, my name is Hashim Rasul, and uh, address is 7612 Peach Blossom Drive, Plano, Texas. Um, so we're asking for 38% for the uh, open storage, and then we're also asking to be for the open storage to be on a flex base or a gravel type of uh, pavement. And uh, I think Maxwell told us what the reasons were because of the heavy equipment is going to break the concrete. The concrete's not going to last very long with that kind of weight being driven on it, and also it's going to tear up the machines. But also the 38% of open storage is going to be mainly for uh, material that we have to use on the on the project. We don't resell any any we don't resell any material. 
So it's not there to be stored, waiting to be sold. It's material that's stored to be used on a site, on a project somewhere for either uh, the city of Plano, <clears throat> one of our projects with the city of Plano, or with a different municipality. So all the open storage is gravel, crushed rock. Correct. Very good. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant? Commissioner Riley. Just looking at the overall plan, is the, is the desire to build the building on the track B, the one-story office building, or is that just something that you're putting out there as an idea? No, that would be the headquarters for HQS in the future. They would move their main offices over there, and then they would have other office tenants, and they would be making income off, off other office tenants. But they would be, the head, they would be office out of there long-term um, in, in the future. Yeah. And, and define, is that an immediate need, or is that a long-term 10-year plan? Um, I, I, it's not immediate. I don't think it's 10 years. I don't know what, what you would envision. Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. That's, that's, that's kind of, um, I've been working with his brother more, and, and his brother was saying it's about four, you know, four or five years would be um, a reasonable time frame for phase two. And what about the single family residence? <clears throat> well, the good, thing, the good news is, is that if the single family ever develops to the southeast, um, we could actually have kind of a combination of office and retail. Because I think that's when you have some retail, you might have some neighborhood service demand um, on track B um, because of the residents living there. Right now, it's no man's land. It's, it's, well, there's nothing down there. Maybe, maybe I didn't ask my question correctly. What about the single family residence that's on your site? What is the long-term oh, plan for sorry. that? I think you're talking about that. No, I'm talking about the, the single family the, residence that's on the site currently. There's a single family residence. Um, there's a tenant on the site that has lived there for some time. Um, it's a, a under my understanding, it was, it's been there since before annexation. So it's a, it's a, um, I, a supposedly a legal non-conforming or not, it's a non-conforming use, obviously residential is not allowed. Um, in the future, um, it would likely go away and that would just be either a caretaker's quarters for, for HQS or an office. Um, something that would obviously have to be allowed by um, your zoning regulations. Uh, if, it, if it ever discontinues, it's just a single family home. So is there a reason you didn't look this, at this as one track and look at the ratios as opposed to two tracks? Well, we separated the two tracks because this is all they need for their, their, their yard. Um, we didn't, this kind of keep, keeps the yard compact to one site and allows us to kind of screen it better. If we did 10, I know, I think I know where you're going. You're saying it'll be like if we did 5% on track day and 5% B no, as far as storage. What I'm, what I'm saying is if it wasn't two tracks and the open storage was an ancillary used to track B, it would be a different case. Say that one more time. If it was one track with an office building and ancillary storage out back, it would be a different case. Yeah, yeah. A service contractor is a yard is allowed by right. So, um, you know, we could have up to 5%. Um, outside storage with an office service crop truck or what, whatever you might, you know, I think certain uses allow outside storage. Um, open storage is what it's called. But I'm not, I guess I'm not following your question. Well, if the intent was to build the office and still and maintain the open storage behind it, then it strikes me as odd that you wouldn't submit it as one big tract as one case with an office building with open storage behind it with the intent to build the office building. So my concern is that that what you're really trying to achieve is to make grant to, to make permanent what is now a non-conforming use and maybe, maybe not build this office building later. And and that's uh, I guess I'm wondering why it wasn't done as one combined project as opposed to two separate parcels. Well one reason why is cost. I mean you know we have a business, the business is growing. Um, and so this is this is the the development that meets their business needs and accommodates their office no, office um, and their storage needs yeah. um, moving forward. So that that's that's the main reason. Um, you know, we're not trying to perpetuate non-conforming uses. I mean, this pr proposed business is allowed except for the the, out, the outside storage, um, which we're trying to mitigate through screening. But it is a necessary part of their business. They can't store everything on the inside. There's a lot of gravel and different things that go along with building streets and sidewalks. Um, so, but 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 Plan B would be to move to have their their main offices over there. As they grow, they'll they'll have more um, not only more admin but hopefully more workers, um, 
and then they would either lease out um, to other you know office users and, and hopefully retailers if single family ever develops well south southeast okay thank you <clears throat> any other questions for the applicant Commissioner Horn. Yes, with this 38% gravel, and you're going to be storing heavy equipment, one of my concerns is environmental impact by petroleum, oil, and lubrication leaking from your equipment. And it does leak from heavy-duty equipment because mm -hmm. that's part of what POL does mm -hmm. when they come out to your site. What plans do you have to, to mitigate that environmental risk? I mean, again, we're looking at a piece of property that was planned in the future to be part of Envision Oak Point. You right. know, now all of a sudden, say for instance, you're bought out or a city buys it out, puts transit there. Now we got an environmental issue to deal with. Right. What are you doing to mitigate that environmental? Uh, well, there, there's always, anytime you have equipment, there's always some um, oil that comes off that equipment. Um, it's not a lot more than you have with other, with just the oil that basically comes off your car and is on the streets. Um, um, so, there's not there's not a lot of extra there um, with these type of machines. Um, there's some curing compound that to cure the concrete, but it's it's concealed. It's not anything that that you know that would be that would leach into the ground. Um, there's always that concern, but even if this was paved, it's not like the paving. Anytime you have storm water, a lot of times that you know the paving just leads it to a storm drain, and then it ends up going into a creek anyway sometimes there's some mitigating factors sometimes there's not there is with some auto uses um but um you know we're not gonna we're not gonna be breaking any state or or federal laws when it comes to um you know contaminating the environment i think there's probably some other things that you guys do you can probably speak on um as far as your machines go that, that don't you know keep by up you know up upkeep and maintenance and that sort of thing just as far as like oils and yeah, I, I think that's the main purpose of the, uh, the service contractor building is so that in an event we do have a piece of equipment that is broken or more specifically it has a hydraulic leak or an oil leak, you know, we want to get that machine serviced as fast as we can so that we can get it back on the job site so we're not wasting money renting machinery. So being able to repair our equipment quickly is, is obviously one of the things that we always do. And if I might add, the service contractor building that we're building is going to be concrete, of course. It's going to be inside. That's going to allow us to repair any of the machines on site um, so they're not sitting outside. Part of this, um, part of this request is just will, will be an improvement overall, just operationally for our business and would be, would be better for the environment um, as far as working on, on vehicles inside and, and containing that within a... Um, you know, a drain in, in any event, like not, not like you would see at an auto repair business. Uh, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Okay, I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. We do not. Are you losing your voice? <laughs> She's not even talking. All right, with that, we'll close the public hearing, confine discussion to the commission. Um, I'm happy to go first if anyone else is. And I, um, I grew up in construction. I've seen lots and lots of construction yards. They're all a mess, no matter how hard you try. Um, my concern uh, primarily is that this doesn't fit into a future vision um, at all. Um, there are other pieces of property there that uh, the living earth and stuff like that and I fully believe that someday guess what they'll be relocating to another location uh, what's going to eventually come into into being in this area um, this this just doesn't fit in there so when I look at land use and say what's the best appropriate use for this piece of property if it was already zoned you already had your occupancy all of that I think this is a different kind of discussion but the way it sits right now, um, I, I don't see this working. Uh, Commissioner Ratliff asked about why not do a single lot because then the percentage of open space you're asking for is smaller. Several different reasons why it might have made a, a little better presentation. But 
Uh, I, I'm skeptical. We don't know what will happen in the construction industry over the next uh, five years. And five years from now, we may see that getting sold off to some other development. Uh, but we still have this big contractor service yard. And uh, that being there actually will, will impact what can go around it. So I, I think we're, we're better off having more options. And this, for me anyway, I think it limits our options down the road. That's, that's my two cents, uh, but Commissioner Ali. Um, echo what you said regarding the future land use and uh, the best use um, going into the future and have concerns about, I didn't hear anything that um, allayed my concerns about um, pollution that will come from the natural use, or at least what you're proposing. Um, to use the land floor. I, again, I, I don't have a background in construction. I, the, the thoughts that come to my head is there's some way, sorry, that's telling me to put my kids to bed. Uh, <laughs> <is there. laughs> I'm sorry, we're running long. <laughs> um, but some, some mitigating buffer on the concrete that would allow the heavy equipment not to break the concrete down and prevents a, it presents a natural barrier or something. But the way it's, it, it's presented suggests that it's essentially, you know, you're going to get runoff. It, it, if I'm going to put words mm -hmm. in your mouth, you're going to get runoff uh, regardless. Um, so why not just use the, you know, 38% 30, gravel and becomes a bit of a free-for-all from a runoff perspective. So I, just on the pollution hazards that this potentially um, presents, you know, makes me inclined not to go along with this. Commissioner Horn. Uh, a couple of points. Um, there are mitigating uh, methods on concrete using oil water separators. I've been in the construction industry for 20 plus years and seen civil, uh, civil companies like what you do have that type of mitigation and even for the larger construction firms like Lane, those guys. So I think what you're proposing here is just going to, um, down the line, leave us with a, uh, an environmental headache. All right, okay. The second element here that I'm really disappointed, or not disappointed, is uh, back in 2018 when Envision Oak Point came out, um, I was part of the Parks and Rec Board back then. This was put together by planning. It was put together from parks and citizens uh, on a true collaborative approach over the course of four years, I think it took, mm -hmm. to come up with Envision Oak Point. So we just can't summarily dismiss a part because it would be convenient because right now there may not be a, a rail station there. This is again a vision of what's going to occur there to open up the gateway to Northeast Plano. So uh, I'm thinking because of the environmental issue of what you're asking for, with regards to the gravel, no matter how impervious and how, how you press it, coupled with conflicting with uh, Envision Oak Point, I'm afraid I have to deny the application. Commissioner Rado. Yeah, just to echo some of the other comments that have been made and explain kind of why I asked the questions I did, I think it, my interpretation of the answers I got was that um, the future building is a future maybe kind of sort of to pretty up a problem that they currently have to, and in my opinion, to try to get us to approve an existing non-conforming use so they can expand. And and um, if it was one big project where we're actually going to build a building and promise to build a building and actually build a building, then then I might feel differently. But at this point, all we're asked really really being asked to do is to approve the expansion of an existing non-conforming use. And I, I can't support that because it doesn't comply with the plan. Um, I might feel differently if it was a combined project. I'm not sure I would, but uh, if it without a combined project, it is very a very clear no for me. Any other comments? Motion. Make a motion. We uh, 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 confer, uh, confirm the city recommendation to deny this uh, zoning change um, as presented. I see. Who said second? So I have a motion by Commissioner Ratliff to deny item 3A and a second by Commissioner Ali. So please vote. 
The vote yes is to deny, and that passes seven to zero. We now need a motion on item 3B. Make a motion. We recommend for denial item 3B. So I have a motion by Commissioner Horn to deny item 3B with a second by Commissioner Ali. Please vote. And that item paces seven to zero as well to deny 3B. Next item, please. Agenda item number four is a public hearing zoning case 2021-026 request to re to consider an amendment to Article 16, Parking and Loading, of the zoning ordinance pertaining to special vehicle parking and related amendments, if found necessary. Applicant is City of Plano. Good evening, Melissa Spriegel, Lead Planner. This is a request to amend a section of the zoning ordinance pertaining to special vehicle parking. This change was requested by the Neighborhood Services Department as there was no consistent direction between the code of ordinances and the zoning ordinance related to the parking of oversized motor vehicles in residential districts. The zoning ordinance defines a special vehicle as a trailer or any self-propelled vehicle which exceeds 22 feet in length. This definition includes semi-trailers, pole trailers, and a number of other commercial vehicles and farm equipment. The zoning ordinance regulates where and how special vehicles are to be stored on private property. However, does not include any prohibitions based on the zoning district where the vehicle will be stored. The code of ordinances also regulates how commercial vehicles are to be stored on private property. However, does include restrictions for residential zoning districts. The code of ordinances prohibits the parking of semi-trailers, pole trailers, truck tractors, and other commercial motor vehicles and farm equipment upon property located within residential zoning district. As both the zoning ordinance and the code of ordinances refer to parking regulations for oversized motor vehicles, but with varying conditions, there is a potential for misunderstanding in the enforcement of these ordinances. Therefore, staff is recommending amendments to Article 16 of the zoning ordinance to be consistent with other laws governing oversized vehicles. This is achieved through a reference in the zoning ordinance given giving deference to other legal prohibitions. This request was reviewed for conformance with the interim comprehensive plan. The interim comprehensive plan supports amendments to the zoning ordinances that aligns with the changing needs and desires of the community. In addition, it encourages a wide range of land use opportunities, provided they contribute to neighborhood attractiveness and vitality. Therefore, the proposed amendments are in conformance with the interim comprehensive plan. This amendment will provide more precise guidance on the enforcement of city codes. For this reason, staff recommends approval as shown in the write-up. And I can answer any questions. Questions, uh, Commissioner Ratliff. Just to clarify special uh, vehicles, does that include campers, motorhomes, boats? If it's um, 22 feet in length or longer, yes. Okay. But only self-propelled ones, or does that, would that include a boat on a trailer? So it is defined as um, self-propelled. Because it, you included in your definition of pole trailers, and so I didn't know if any other kind of trailers were included. Yeah, so the, it is defined as self-propelled, so it's anything that is self-propelled. Okay, so it will be restricted just to motorhomes, not necessarily campers or, or boats on trailers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, i just clarify that. Uh, right. I think it, it, what I'm reading is the zoning ordinance defines a special vehicle as a trailer or any self-propelled vehicle which exceeds 22 feet in length. So any, any trailer. Yeah, that's why I was asking the question. Because yeah, I think and that's why I was wanting to clarify that. Exactly. Yeah. Because you could have a boat on a trailer, but yes. it's only 16 feet long, right? But it's still a trailer, so it can't be stored permanently or yes. for a lengthy period of time. And so that's my follow-up question, because a 16-foot boat is often on a trailer that's much longer than 16 feet. So is it the length of the trailer, or is it the length of the... <laughs> <laughs> Are you shopping for a boat? No, I'm not. I just, I, I, I have, I've had an incident where there was one stored next door to me that I yes. tried to get removed and was unsuccessful. Ah, okay. There we go. 
Uh, I, I guess that's a valid question because it says trailer or any self-propelled vehicle that ex which exceeds 22 feet in length. So, is, but the way the quotes are done, the trailer is outside. So, which is accurate? Any trailer or any trailers longer than 22 feet? Mm -hmm. Try to look at the ordinance. All right, we're going to get back to you on okay, that. Okay, thank you. I guess. Yeah. Is there another? Is there another question for staff on this item? Uh, I would ask a question of how long is it allowed for you pull your boat up, you come back from the lake, you get back at 8 o'clock at night, you're going to leave it the next day, you're going to clean it out, uh, and then take it back to storage. Is that legal or nope? Sorry, it's got to fit in your driveway or you just can't bring it home. What is the actual code uh, in the city when it comes to that kind of activity? The whole intent here is to try to get us both on the same page, right? Yeah, exactly. So what is that same page? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was looking at the ordinance, so you I may have to repeat that ordinance. question unless you got that. The ordinance section does say a trailer of any length designed to be towed on public streets or any self-propelled vehicle which exceeds 22 feet in length. Okay. okay. That's much clearer. It's much better. Now, and then what was the subsequent yeah. question? Well, the subsequent question is, again, what define stored what if it's stored there for eight hours or 12 or 36 or is there some kind of limitation there as i pointed out the, the guy goes fishing brings his boat home it's late at night he just parks it alongside the house goes inside the next day wants to go out and clean it up maybe make a few repairs take it back to storage the next evening or something like that is he going to get a fine is there going to be something going on what's the how long is it before it's defined as storage versus, uh, you know. I think this could be a great question for uh, Scott Lucier from Property Standards since you're the one who actually oh. does enforcement on these things. He's, he's so, sitting yes. up there smiling. He exactly. knows the answer. He does. He was just waiting on one of us to ask the smart exactly. guy. <laughs> I knew the question was coming. Ah, okay. Well, you should have been down here if you knew it was coming. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Lucier. I am the property standards manager. Um, and, and if you could clarify your question as far as is being stored, stored on a property or stored on the street? On the street. So again, you, you bring it home. Most people don't have room in their driveway to put their boat, their car, their truck, everything else. And they, they park it alongside their house. And again, they go in, they've been out all day. The next day is Sunday. They go out, they're going to clean the boat out and uh, maybe repair the motor's got a bad problem or they need to fix a little hole in it or something and the next evening or even the next day on Monday morning he takes it back to where it's typically stored at what point does it move from being just a it's it's just temporary just drop there while he's doing some work on it because otherwise we're telling everybody who owns some vehicle like that you can't have it at your location unless you can fit it in your driveway you can't do any repairs you can't bring your uh, travel trailer there to the house and, and get it stored up for the weekend for the trip. Instead, you've got to haul everything to the storage yard. What's our definition? At what point does someone, you know, run afoul of, of the code in terms of it being parked on the street? Okay. Um, parked on the street is, is a PD enforced thing. I'm, I'm familiar with it, but not formally. Um, okay. trailers, trailers disconnected from a motor vehicle cannot be parked on the street at all for any, any period of time. Um, and there's there's a difference in the codes between storage and parking okay. or allowed to be parked. Um, most of the code, code of ordinance specifically states park or allowed to be parked. Um, storage comes typically comes into play when, when we talk about the zoning ordinance, mm -hmm. um, storage of special vehicles and so forth. Um, trailers on, on private property, either on the driveway or an extension of the driveway or front front drive, um, as long as they are sto stored stored there in accordance with the, the zoning ordinance, they can be there for any period of time once they're on the property. Um, but parking on the street, detached from a vehicle, they're not allowed at all for any period of time. Okay. Is that, is that reasonable, though? Is that what we really want, to have somebody get a fine because they came home disconnected from their boat to take their wife to dinner and they come home, they got a fine because their boat parked alongside the curb, Commissioner Rowley. I was going to follow up on that too, because if, if I've got a 
34 foot motorhome and I park it out front, it's operable. It can be moved. How long can I leave it parked in front of my house? I'm sorry, I couldn't. If, if I have a 34 foot motorhome and I park it in front of my house, how long can I leave it there? If it's parked on the street, mm -hmm. um, it's motorhome is different than a trailer. That's why I'm asking the yeah. question. Motor, yeah. Motorhomes parked on the street, I believe, I don't believe there's any prohibition to it. Um, as long as it's not being used for housekeeping. In other words, somebody living in it on the street. But it's a motor vehicle, so it's allowed to be parked on the street, my understanding of, of what the code is. The, the trailer park comes in um, specifically into play um, once it's been detached from the vehicle. So the trailer is there standalone, not attached to any vehicle, and that's not permitted to be parked on the street. So my concern would be that I've got a neighbor with a 34-foot motorhome, or I used to, and if I make it where he can't park it in his driveway, all he does is move it to the street, and now we've all got to look at it. Um, if we pass this modification, it would encourage him to move it to the street as opposed to leaving it in his driveway if his driveway was gravel, and that, that, that concerns me. Um. I've seen a lot of, I think the, the words here is residential street. Is that correct? If I read it correctly, the parking is not allowed for all these uh, trailer, any size of trailer or any motor vehicles that's um, longer than 20 feet, 22 feet, 22 feet for residential streets. And I think there's a purpose for that. I agree with that because for our neighborhoods or most neighborhoods I've seen, the streets are narrower than parking. If you had two large vehicles parked there, even though for five minutes there might be emergencies from the neighbor that need to pass that street, then you can't pass if you have two vehicles happen to park at the same time. So we just can't allow that at any time. The same holds true though with a 34-foot mobile home or motor home parked on the street and the neighbors parked out on the street across from it. Nobody can get through, but our code says it's allowed, evidently, because it's self-propelled and uh, it's a motor vehicle. But in here it says any self-propelled vehicle which exceeds 22 feet in length. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that we're, we're trying to get all on the same page, but I'm not sure we've kind of worked through the different questions and... I see another mic on over here. So. Uh, uh, regardless of what we do tonight, who's going to enforce this ordinance once something comes out from us? Who's going to enforce it? Neighborhood Services enforces the Code of Ordinance parking requirements and the Zoning Ordinance parking requirements. Um, so it's, it's Property Standards Division and Neighborhood Services would do the enforcement. Any, any parking on the street is, is handled by the police department. So do you operate mostly on complaints from neighbors that, uh, is, is that how you get your information or? As far as the, the park, the, yeah, the parking. Who, who do go after? An angry neighbor calls in and says. We do, we do proactive enforcement. Um, okay. We do proactive and we also respond to complaints that we receive. So our specialists who are in the field are out driving the streets and alleys looking for everything from high grass and weeds to substandard structures. Um, and then we also receive complaints through a number of mediums. Okay, so the same, the same guy that tells me to cut my bushes hanging over the alley is, is likely yes, to catch the guy up the street with his huge Ram 2500 and a boat behind it that sits all the time. He's, he's likely to catch that. Okay. Well, and I don't think any of it matters if, again, the, the fire department can't get through with their truck, they're going to give you a, a warning as well. So, sure. uh, yes, Commissioner Kerry. Uh, Commissioner Stone, that would actually, the big ram truck and everything would still be legal. So they can do that, I think. As yeah. long as he keeps his truck connected. Correct. Which most of the time he does. So he's got like a 40 foot barricade in front of his house. <laughs> Well, um, a, I, I have a question real quick, sir. Yes. Um, I, I'm trying to understand the front yard and the gravel surface versus the non-gravel surface because I don't know what percentage of residents we have that do not have paved driveways. But if I have a gravel surface, I, I'm just trying to understand the difference of why we want to prohibit that. Gravel surface is permitted for trailers. 
in the back of a property. And, and my question is, why is it not permitted in the front? I couldn't. I can't answer that question. It, that, that was in place. Uh, it's been go, in place go for a long time. Yeah. Go ahead. I think there are certain heritage districts where it's permitted, um, and perhaps the estate development district. Um, may there may be some exceptions there if I'm if memory serves that. But that's. It, it, the city of Plano has parking standards that you park on concrete, probably for similar environmental reasons that we've been discussing earlier this evening. But but I guess my, yes, so I understand that. I guess my question is then, <clears throat> am, I am not allowed to have a gravel driveway. Then I'm just trying to learn something here. Yes. That, that in in the front of my house. Then is that accurate? Unless because then I would with, park a car on it. With rare exception, yes. Okay. Thank you. We had a very lengthy discussion about gravel when I was on council one time. I've learned more about it than I want to know. Commissioner Horn. Well, I was thinking about getting to your point that gravel, it's going to be specific geographically speaking within the city. If you go out on Parker, you're going to see some farms out there oh, yeah. that are estates, if you will, that uh, they have gravel. But the typical homeowner, no, they're not going to allow that. All right. So <laughs> I'm afraid to ask, do we have more questions? Commissioner Ratliff. I think I think my issue, I, I think I think this is 90% of the answer. I think my concern is how does this work dovetail with the PD, with the with the police department um, and parking on the street. I don't want to inadvertently incentivize people to move things out of their front yard onto the street as, or, or out of their backyard onto the street by saying you can't park it back there, but as long as it's running, you can park it in front of your house. Um, I, I want to understand that relationship of how that's enforced. Let's, let's listen to the legal minds here. Um, commissioners, I just want to mention the, the reason for this proposed amendment was to clarify the fact that if you're otherwise prohibited by any other law, that you can't park these vehicles. There, there was confusion because it says all special vehicles must conform to the following and it lists all these things that are required. But our code of ordinance actually prohibits some special vehicles from being parked here at all. And we wanted to just make it clear that if you're already prohibited by other law, this doesn't allow you to park. So I know we're having broader conversations about what the law should be. And, and maybe you want to propose more amendments later, but this is a really narrow amendment just meant to fix a small problem. All right, so, so. yeah, so before we yes. revamp the city's entire street ordinance and parking codes, <laughs> uh, which we're, I'm, we're happy to discuss later, but probably that's more of a council issue for us. All we're trying to do right now is make sure that, that, that what, we, what we do from the zoning side uh, meets the, the other side of the house and, there's not a conflict. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. I could just point out, I don't think this is effectively changing the law at all. What yeah. it's doing is cross-referencing law to make yeah. it clearer for people. As you read the zoning ordinance, hey, you might want to know there's some other rules that you need to abide by. Yeah. That's all it is. It's not changing the rules in effect. Okay. It's just giving people notice that there are other rules in another place that you need to know about. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, I'm afraid to ask. Do we have any more? No. All right. We'll open the public hearing. Does anybody out there want to speak on this? No, they do not. Oh, thank God. Okay, <laughs> I'll close the public hearing. <laughs> Confined discussion to commission. I move we approve item four. <laughs> second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for agenda item four. Please vote. That item carries by a vote of seven to zero. I was actually expecting it to be like split or something. <laughs> Agenda item number five. Agenda item number five is a public hearing, replat, revised site plan, and concept plan. Chisholm Place edition number four, block A, lots one R and two, shopping center and restaurant on two lots on 5.2 acres located at the northwest corner of US Highway 75 and Chisholm Place. 
zone corridor commercial with specific use permits number 189 and number 272 for private club. Applicant is Genco DMLT Limited. Good evening, everyone. The replat revised site plan and concept plan for Chisholm Place edition number five, block A, lots one R and two are recommended for approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for staff, Commissioner Stone? Just quickly, is there a drive-through lane uh, planned for this new restaurant? No, it is a standalone restaurant building on the concept plan. Do we know uh, the name or the genre that it will be? They did not share that. Okay. Thank you. Any other quest questions for staff? I'm seeing none. We'll open the public hearing. Or do we have any speakers on this item? The applicant is available to answer any questions, but do not want to speak. Any questions for the applicant? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Combine discussion to the commission. Recommend approval of item number five as submitted. Second. So we have a motion by Commissioner Stone to approve item five with a second by Commissioner Horn. Uh, please vote. Lynette, how's your voice? I'm afraid she's not going to make it through another one. Uh, agenda item number six is a public hearing replat. K Avenue edition, block A, lot one. Professional general administrative office on one lot on point three acre, located on the west side of K Avenue, 110 feet north of 18th Street. Zone downtown business government. Applicant is Sarah Carpenter. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. I'm Roja Pulati, the planner with the planning department. Staff recommends approval of this free plat as submitted, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions for staff on this item? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. Close public hearing. Confine discussion. Commission. Make a motion we approve agenda item number six. Second. I have a commission, uh, motion by Commissioner Horn with a second by Commissioner Ratliff to approve item agenda item number six. Please vote. That item is approved seven to zero. Next item. And I think I have a hearing problem, so it's just not a good night. <laughs> so one can't speak, one can't hear. <laughs> it's getting late. It's getting late. All right. Number seven. Agenda item number seven is a public hearing replant and revised site plan. Plano West Retail Center, Block 1, Lot 1R. Retail and Professional General Administrative Office on one lot on 15.7 acres, located on the west side of the Dallas North Tollway, 865 feet south of Park Boulevard, Zone Plan Development 220 Regional Commercial and Regional Commercial, and located within the North Dallas Tollway Overlay District. Applicant is Costco Wholesale Corporation. These items are recommended for approval as submitted, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Seeing none, public hearing. Any speakers? No, there are not. Close the public hearing. It's fine. Discussion to commission. Oh, come on. You can do it. I make a motion to approve number seven, number seven as staff recommended. Second. <laughs> All right, so we have a motion by Commissioner Tong. Well done, thank you. And a second by the Commission Choir. I'm not sure who did that. We'll go with Commissioner Horn uh, to approve agenda item seven. Please vote. And that item carries by a vote of seven to zero. Next item, please. Agenda item number eight is a public hearing preliminary replant and revised site plan. Plano Tech Center 2, Block 1, Lot 2R. 
data center on one lot on 14.5 acres located on the southwest corner of Plano Parkway and Shiloh Road, zoned Research Technology Center and located within the 190 Tollway Plano Parkway Overlay District. Applicant is Via West Incorporated. The preliminary replot is recommended for approval subject to additions and or alterations to the engineering plans as required by the engineering department and the revised site plan is recommended for approval as submitted. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. We do not have any speakers. Thank you. Close the public hearing, confine discussion to commission. Make a motion we approve agenda item number eight, the preliminary replat, recommended approval of addition and or alterations to engineering plans, and also make a recommendation we approve the revised site plan as recommended. I second. All right, so we have a motion by Commissioner Horn to approve as recommended agenda item number eight, with a second by Commissioner Tong. Please vote. And that item carries by a vote of seven to zero. Our next and final item. Last item, agenda item number nine, public, public hearing preliminary replat, 9, 1897 edition, block A, lots one and two, 1897 townhome edition, block B, lots one through, one through 15, block C, lots one through 16, 270 multifamily units, 31 single family residents attached lots and retail on 5.5 acres located at the northeast corner of M Avenue and 14th Street. Zone plan development 133 downtown business government. Applicant is TWCP Westheimer Wilcrest Limited. Thank you, Ms. Bridges. Um, staff recommends approval of this preliminary replat um, subject to additions and or alterations to the engineering plans as required by uh, the engineering department. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions for staff? All right. Public hearing, no speakers? No speakers. Thank you. Close public hearing. Make a motion to approve agenda item number nine as recommended. Um, by staff subject to additions and alterations uh, required by the engineering department. Well done. Second. All right. So we have a motion by Commissioner Ali to approve agenda item nine as recommended and a second by Commissioner Ratliff. Please vote. And that item carries by a vote of seven to zero. Thank you all for your patience tonight. Covered a lot of ground. I feel like we did a lot of housekeeping there at the end. It seemed like just a whole lot of get this done. All right, we're adjourned. Nine thirty-one.